This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 645, recorded on July 23rd, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hello again, Daniel. It is a week later already. Time flies, and uh, Chuck can't make it tonight. So it's just you and me and a COVID-19 update. What's going on? You know, I... I wish for the day. I hope for the day. You know, when I say Vincent, I think we're done. There's nothing more to talk about. But every week, there's so much to talk about. I, I try to organize like, what what will I leave out? What will I focus on? Yeah, I, I was I worry about that day coming too, because I've becoming I've been enjoying this. Uh, on the other hand, when you say there's no more, that means it's good. So we'll have yeah, to so it, it. it'll be mixed. We'll, we will we will celebrate. <laughs> we'll actually, <laughs> okay. we will be ultimately happier. Uh, but I'm going to start with a quote, and this is my quote. I don't know if we have any uh, any Matt Smith or David Tennant or BBC fans, but uh, this is my quote. Masks are cool, the doctor. So we'll see if any of our listeners wow. get the reference. That's great. I like that. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and I think it is. Masks are catching on. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about masks before I kind of get into the meat of things. Um, you know, it was actually back in March when, uh, Vincent, when you had Ian, Ian Lipkin on. Mm -hmm. He had just come back from China, right? And yep. he, um, people remember, people should go back and listen to that because it's really, it's entertaining, I, I think, from my perspective, where he says, you know, I had some viral thing for about a week, then I got the COVID, right? And now we all, now we, we know that pattern. You have a viral thing for a week and then boom, you get the COVID cytokine storm. Um, but on that episode, um, you and Ian talk about masks. And Ian, Ian brings up, you know, there's some data out there. You know, masks are not something without some support. Yeah, and he, yeah. you, you both talk about this back in March. And um, I was being interviewed, I think, maybe the day after uh, that episode came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was being interviewed by someone, and we were talking about social distancing. And they were, you know, basically were saying, I don't really want to be six feet away from my friends. Maybe I could be three feet. I isn't that enough? And after we finished... Um, the reporter asked, do you have anything else you'd sort of want to add? And I said, you know, we just talked all about social distancing, but do you want to talk about masks? Because I really think someone's got to talk about masks. Yeah, you know, and this was this was back in March. And uh, that was, uh, unfortunately, probably my most famous viral quotation when I say you should ma you should wash your mask as often as your underwear. I don't if you search the Internet, unfortunately, Dr. Daniel Griffin masks, the whole underwear quote comes up. So. <laughs> That's right. You get, so, that's the way the internet works. It, it does. Apparently, that was very catchy. Uh, <laughs> it was repeated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was about cotton masks back in March, mm -hmm. and here we are. You know, it, it only took a few days, months, for people to catch on. But yes, masks are cool. Wear them. Um, you know, do, do the right thing. Um, it, this is not a partisan issue. I think hopefully we're all coming together on that. Um, this is about stopping the spread. This is so we can get back to school and back to work and back to uh, getting together with uh, people we care about. So wear those masks. By the way, I spoke with Ian yesterday and mm -hmm. I asked him, are you completely recovered or is there any lingering and he said, I am always exhausted. It's so, it's so tough. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, we talked a while ago, we started talking about the long haul, the fact that a lot of people with COVID don't just get better. And I think we're beginning to realize that may be more the rule than the exception. There's a lot of people. If you're, if you're, you really get sick with this, um, you know, you try to go up a flight of stairs, you try to go out for a run, um, you notice it. There, There is a pretty significant tail to a COVID infection for a lot of individuals. Do you know if that was the case for SARS? Um, to some degree, but I don't think we had the numbers to really see. To see, Yeah, this. with only 8,000 global infections, you're not going to see kind of more rare things happening, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Um, so case numbers, deaths, um, you know, I, I think as we sort of warning people was going to happen when you, when you're sitting here in the U S with over 70,000 new cases a day, um, the deaths are going to go up and the deaths are now, I think it was 1200, um, 
deaths yesterday alone. So the, the numbers numbers have gone up and um, this does not bode well. Um, we The only part of our country right now that seems to be doing okay is this little pocket here in the Northeast. And okay is the right word because we're starting to see a creep. Um, I admitted a gentleman uh, this week who was from a group home. And this is where um, individuals who are not able to be on their own or are together. Um, one person got sick in the group home, then he got sick in the group home. And this just brings back bad memories of the spread within the group homes. Um, so things are not going in the right uh, direction. Uh, transmission slash testing. I want to put these together. So I'm going to I'm going to tell a little bit of a story at the end about a particular patient and sort of go through what we should know and how things sh should go um, differently than they went for this one patient. But um, I, I'm going to continue to harp on transmission and testing because um, I think we all really care about this. And, um, you know, why do we care so much? Why does it keep coming up? Why is it in the media? And I think, um, you know, particularly for those of us that see many of these individuals, right, such as doctors, nurses, hospital employees, waiters, security guards, people that just leave their house ever. Um, this is all of us, right? With 70,000 plus new cases. And we say we're only diagnosing about, you know, 10% of the folks. Mm. I mean, it's millions of people. This is, we all care about. Um, so just, just to reiterate, I think what we've been saying all along, um, there is some degree of contact. Most of it is droplet. You're within six feet of someone who's coughing, sneezing, speaking, singing. Um, and there's some certain circumstances where you have airborne. So we, we know this, and I, and I think the best way to protect yourself is um, to stay outdoors. Outdoors is a great place. This virus transmits much better indoors. Um, but stay six feet away. Protect your eyes. Protect your mouth. Protect your nose. Help protect your neighbor's eyes, mouth, and nose by wearing a mask. Um, we hear about super spreader events all the time, and, and a lot of people email me, actually, about this. Um, every time there's a sp super spreader event, they think, well, that must mean that there's airborne. But just to define for all our clinicians who get asked about this, what is a super spreader? Um, it sounds much more exciting than it really is. Um, I mean, it's all based upon the reproductive number. Um, and we have what we call the 80-20 80, uh, 80 rule. Um, and the idea is about 80% of people just spread it to one or two um, other people. Um, but with a lot of uh, respiratory illnesses, so instead of that 1.4 to 3.9, um, there are some few people that spread it to more. And for SARS-1, the definition was eight or more people you spread it to. Um, you know, and this is, fortunately, we just had a call from uh, one of the clinicians a little farther east who just had three new COVIDs today. And, and they were each, they had gone to a party with, you know, one was a graduation party with more than 50 people. And that was this weekend. And now they're sick. Another individual, it was just, I don't know what was being celebrated, but again, you know, about 50 people all together, you know, and, and we've been to parties, you know, there's always that guy, I would say that guy, but that individual who's just real excited and has no sense of six feet, and you you feel <laughs> that that excitement, <laughs> you know, just hear the excitement. Um, so yeah, you don't need to be aerosolizing. Someone gets this in your eyes, in your mouth. People are not wearing masks. Um, little recap of what's new, because there's a little bit of new as far as guidance from the CDC. Uh, and the CDC sort of couches and said, this is guidance, this is, this is not a rule, um, but they're trying to somehow figure out um, what to do relative to testing. Um, and there's actually, I'll say, they are discouraging repeat testing during the first 90 days after a positive test, unless there's a specific reason to do it. Um, and so what are, what are their changes? What are they saying? Um, so they have a duration of isolation and precautions. And... They're saying for most people with COVID-19 um, illness, uh, isolation and uh, precautions can generally be discontinued generally 10 days after symptom onset and resolution of fever, um, as long as you have at least 24 hours at that tail end um, where they are fever-free without any um, medications to make them fever-free, um, and the other symptoms have improved. So, um, But they do point out that that's for that chunk of people with mild outpatient illness, um, and then for the number of people who have severe disease, um, that you know they may actually produce replication-competent virus beyond 10 days, 
Um, we've actually seen the ability to isolate um, virus from folks out as far as 20 days. So they basically say once you get outside of that um, sort of limited mild, then you want to involve an infectious um, control expert or an infectious disease physician to sort of help you. Um, but for persons who never develop symptoms, um, they're actually basically saying, let's start that clock um, 10 days after the first positive PCR, right? Because for them, you don't have a, a symptom onset. So giving you a sense of, of what to do. Now, in New York, for instance, if you're going to send that person to a group home, a nursing home, a facility with as high-risk individuals, um, we're still doing uh, the PCR testing. Um, and as mentioned, with all the issues that come with that. So, um, so the, the 70,000 cases you mentioned a day in the U.S., are, are these mainly people who are symptomatic and go for care, or is there a a certain amount of random testing in there as well. So I don't, I don't have, and I don't think anyone actually has the exact breakdown of you know the stuff I would love to see, right? Mm -hmm. Which is who's symptomatic, um, who's not symptomatic, um, and then even you know we'd love to see the the, the mm -hmm. values, how how you know symptomatic, and then I'd love to see sort of how far are they from time of onset of symptoms, right? So I've seen in some parts of the country, you know people in cars getting swabs. So they're just going to get it. But yep. I don't think that's normal. That's probably a rare occurrence, right? You know, it's changing in certain areas. I'll say like the New York area, for instance, there's a lot of people who are getting um, tested for surgery. They want to go to surgery, for instance. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of screening for situations like that. We actually do, as mentioned, we do a, a okay. number of tests prior to people going to a facility. We also do testing on pretty much everyone who comes into the hospital to determine um, what sort of isolation precautions to to use. So in in certain places, there's different protocols for um, okay. who gets tested. Um, one of the things they do say, and I think this is important, is they say the role of ser serological testing, and basically it has no role in sort of isolation precautions. And, and I get this question all the time, boy, if someone has positive serology, um, I probably don't even do that PCR because we know they're negative. We see people who come in with positive serology and positive PCR. There's a somewhat sophisticated um, calculation you could do with information we don't have access to. If you had access to um, the level of their antibodies and the level of the virus in the test, then you know there is some literature suggesting you could probably do a, an individual calculation, um, but we don't necessarily have that information. So you're talking about the cycle threshold for the genomes, right? Yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about that. Okay. So let's let's jump into that. <laughs> um cuz you know, I, I was thinking about this, you know, so I'm I'm thinking about going sailing this evening, you know, and uh if if I ask somebody say, "Hey, I'm thinking about going sailing, you know, what what do you think? You know, should I go or not?" you know, what's, what's the weather going to be like? And they said, oh, you know, it's going to be in the 270s Kelvin, and we've got a, a Zephyr at 14 knots. Most people would just look at that person. You feel like you're on Charlie Brown talking to the, you know, the grown-up. You're like, yeah, is, is that good? <laughs> do I want to do that? Um, and I was talking to uh, Bonnie Simmons, who runs, I guess, the 30 urgent cares we now have in the area, so we're growing. Um, and you know, I was like, you know what, let me just translate CT values into something that that makes sense, right? Something, something, you know, like, like Fahrenheit, right? Like if, if someone said, oh, it's going to be in the low 80s, and we got a breeze coming out of, you know, the north that this, you know, people are like, oh, okay, now, now I know what to do. So I did, I actually brought the envelope with me, right? Because I did these back of envelope calculations. <laughs> and then I'm like, you know what, it's easier if I just talk to Siri and have her do the math. Mm -hmm. Um but I wanted to talk to people a little bit about what are these CT values that keep getting discussed? What do they mean for us? And what do they mean for testing? So I actually went through this a little bit. So talking a little bit about what are the tests that people are getting? Mm -hmm. So one of the, the classic tests that came out right up front was um, one of the nucleic acid amplification tests. So this is the, the RT-PCR. Um, and so this can be either a quantitative or a qualitative and give you like, oh, yep, we found some, or it can actually tell you um, how much virus was there to begin with based upon when the, the technology could detect it. Um, so I know, and, you know, and, and I'm going to say, 
um, when when Tony Fauci was on, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, if you get a positive test, you could always just pick up the phone, call the lab, ask them what that CT value is, ask them, like, how much viruses. Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> so, And you can't for two reasons. One is um, no test is FDA approved as a quantitative COVID test. So they're not allowed to tell you actually per the FDA, none of the tests. And so, oh. um, so Anthony and FDA should call, give him a call because I know he listens to TWIB and so he's gonna jump on this for us. Um, Cause I think that would be helpful, interesting information for a lot of us. Um, the other is that a lot of the technology does not give you that quantitative number. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit as we talk about the test. So, um, you know, if you're in a research lab, and boy, I used to do, I don't know, about a 1000 of these a day in these trays that had, you know, hundreds per tray. Um, actually, I, I didn't have to do all of them later on. I had a, a master's student mm -hmm. who was there for the summer. Um, and she did these where we'd end up like figures with thousands of data points. Um, but when you're doing a preliminary chain reaction. So the PCR that we keep talking about, every cycle you're basically doubling. So you start with, we'll say one, and then you have two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, so on, all the way up. You start with 100, and you go 200, 400, so and so. So when people talk about CT, each CT is each doubling till you get to a point where you can actually detect the signal and the machine can say it's there. Um, in our fancy research labs, we could actually sit there, and I would do this early on when I was very anxious for the result, waiting for that signal to come up and cross the threshold. Um, but a lot of the machines that are now in use, they basically, they don't check to see if there's a signal there until they hit cycle 39. So you're getting basically a plus or a negative, and you could call that lab person all day. And one is most people are going to say, it's a black box. All it does is tell me at cycle 39, yes or no, I can't get that number. Um, but, but let's talk about the, what do the CT values actually mean? So the most sensitive um, reverse transcriptase PCR machines that came out initially, they can detect about 80 pieces of RNA in a, in a milliliter sample. So you stick a swab in someone's nose, you stick it in the mouth, you stick it wherever you're gonna stick it. Um, you put it in that little vial, you put it in the machine. And if there are basically are 80 little bits of RNA, and this doesn't necessarily mean virions, this is just RNA, it could be fragments, et cetera, just little pieces of RNA, you are gonna pick that up um, basically by cycle 39 with some of these machines. Um, but at what point, at what amount of virus do people become infectious? And I think we know that now. You basically need to have so much virus that if someone sticks a Q-tip in your nose, they're gonna pull out about a million pieces of RNA on that Q-tip, right? And so these are, you know, you pull that out. And you know, I think Ian, what did he come up in the 20s, right? Yeah, he was talking. Because yeah. yeah, he did it in his lab so he could get the number. Yeah, and that that's actually, that's that's someone who's infectious. Yeah. If your um, cycle threshold is 24 or below, um, you got a lot of virus. You got millions or more per milliliter on that Q-tip sample, right? Um, and those are the people we want to detect. Um, the, um, and the, the PCR, as I mentioned, these super sensitive machines, they can pick up when you have a, a hundred on there. Um, what about the Abbott ID now, right? We, we had a paper that came out um, and this is sort of the history that that sort of killed us. The paper comes out um, first as a preprint, then it gets published and it was, Performance of Abbott ID Now COVID-19 Rapid Nucleic Acid Amplification Test in Nasopharyngeal Swabs. Uh, I'll stop reading. <laughs> but, um, this this paper was, you know, another one of those things that sort of like, you know, kicked out our legs. And I, oh, you can't use it. And um, if you look at this, um, the the sensitivity of the Abbott ID Now it can pick up anyone who has five thousand or more bits of RNA on that Q-tip. I mean that's that's great. It's fine. Yeah. If you if you <laughs> if you looked at anyone with a CT value of less than thirty three point five, it picked them all up. Yeah. Yeah. So it picked up everyone who was infectious, right? But what they did is they basically said, but if you crank up, if you start looking at people with you know who have just a few hundred or people who have only about eighty people, you're gonna miss all those people. Mm -hmm. And you know it, if someone comes into the hospital and they've been sick for two weeks, and they're now in the tail end of their cytokine storm, okay, 
maybe that, you know, RNA level is pretty low. And I need to know it, not because I'm worried they're going to spread the disease, but because I'm trying to figure out about steroids or anticoagulation. But when someone shows up in the urgent care clinic or the office and says, I'm not feeling well, I got a fever, or I got a cough, I've been sick for a day or two, that kind of person, they have millions, if not more, virus in that, in that swab. Um, so the sensitivity of the PCR is down to about 100. Sensitivity of the ID now is about 5,000. The sensitivity of these quick, cheap antigen tests, it's about 50,000. So again, it's going to pick up, yeah, you know, everyone who's infectious. That was basically Michael Minna's message that what we need to know is when someone is infectious, right? Yeah. And I think that that's, I think people need to understand this. I think yeah. this is really critical, right? You know, if you show up at the urgent care center, you show up at the doctor's office, you don't feel well. If you're someone who's got enough virus that you're going to infect your, your neighbor, your coworker, you will have a positive test yeah. on one of the antigen um, detection systems. You'll have a positive test on the Abbott ID now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, of course, you're going to have a positive test on the PCR. But you know what? You're going to keep probably having positive PCRs on that PCR thing um, for a long time because it's going to pick up like 80 little fragments on a Q-tip. So. And the ID now and the rapid antigen test, you'll get a lot quicker than your PCR. <laughs> Yes. Oh, my. <laughs> You'll actually know that that person is infectious before they infect everyone, which is really what we need to know, right? Yes. I mean, if you're going to go into the office, if you're going to go into schools, you don't want to send the kid in and then find out a week later, oh, by the way, we sent a bunch of infectious kids into mm -hmm. the schools. Yeah. So um, I think that this is important. And, you know, and the technology is there um, back in um, actually May 8th, right? Quidel got approval for a you know, rapid test. BD got approval back mm -hmm. actually just on the second of this month, July second. Um, or Ashore has, you know, this is this little plastic thing with a white part that comes out, and you just put it in your mouth. It's a quick saliva test, um, and it's going to be like a pregnancy one. You just hold mm -hmm. it up and you look, and do I see my two lines? So the technology is there. We've got to change a lot of it. We have to change the mindset. Um, you know, I mentioned the thirty um, urgent cares that we have. We have um, Abbott ID nows at all these different urgent mm -hmm. cares, but there was a hesitancy to use it because people, you know, people were told, "Are oh, you going to miss cases? Mm -hmm. You're not going to miss cases. We care about the cases we care about. You're going to pick them up in about ten minutes. You're going to know, and you're going to be able to to do something to stop transmission. So, so let's all get on board. Um, masks, as I mentioned, I'm going to hit that again. So. Uh, this really seems to be making a difference. There was actually a nice um, article where they looked at um, where in the hospital setting, they started to have the patients wear the masks. And that actually made a big difference, mm -hmm. right? Because the you know patients talk and some of them sing. Most of them don't sing. But yeah, <laughs> it's a great way of... Um, and you have to wear your masks correctly. I, I, I saw my parents for the first time in quite a while. We have socially distanced dinner last night. You know, my dad's got his mask on. And then he um, puts it down, and then he puts it back on inside out. And I'm like, Dad, um, I call him Pop. I'm like, Pop, if you were actually using that mask properly, and someone spoke or coughed, and you got virus on the outside of your mask, what you just did is turn it around and put the virus in your mouth. So you got to wear the mask mm -hmm. properly, right? I mean, I guess he was protecting me, but I was like a good 8 to 10 feet away. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to wear those masks, and they're really going to protect you, you know, pay attention, right? You know? Yeah. This well, is well, like... Daniel, yeah. the good news is last week, at least the president finally said wearing masks is patriotic, right? Which is not great, but it's better than nothing. Uh, so that, yeah, it's... Um, yeah. So hopefully we have... It ceased to be... It will hopefully cease to be a partisan issue. Yes. It's not. We we don't, you know, we want Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Everybody, Democratic yeah. Socialists of America. We want everyone to be healthy and safe and Everyone wants the economy to come back. Everyone wants, I think everyone wants the schools to come back. Mm -hmm, for sure. But yeah, so let's let's all work together. All right, so now I'm going to talk about a specific case as an example, and then I'm just going to go through the clinical presentation and what we understand about phases. And I'm even going to throw out a little new data. We have a little new data that I just um, was discussing today, which was helpful. So 
there was a woman, this is a real case, but I'll, I'll leave out the names and, and personal identifying. And she um, is an older woman who um, Hispanic descent, and she's living down in Florida, and she starts to get sick. And so the daughter realizes my mom is getting sick. We're in Florida. I'm worried about her. I think it's the COVID. Um, so she packs her mom in the car. What does she do? She drives her up to New York, right? Because, you know, here in New York, we've got the experience. We know what to do. So she drives her up and she goes to an urgent care center. It's not a pro-health urgent care center. And so they, they see the woman. Um, they're actually able to do a test and they say, oh, look, it, it is COVID. So you're positive for COVID. Um, you have now been sick for, at this point, it was um, about seven, eight days, right? Um, and they say, okay, so... Um, we're going to do a couple things. Um, first, we're going to give you Augmentin, which is an antibiotic, which has the wonderful side effect of diarrhea because you've got pneumonia and you need antibiotics for your viral pneumonia. And then two, we're going to set you up with a home nebulizer um, because you know what? If your daughter isn't already sick, we want to aerosolize the virus in your home so that she can breathe some in too, <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the, the first two missteps, right? This is a viral disease. Um, viral pneumonias do not improve with, with antibiotics. If anything, you might cause harm. And this woman ended up with diarrhea, which her daughter cleaned up, which increased her exposure there probably. Um, you really want to be careful with nebulizers. We've talked about uh, the ability of, to get this in the air and have other people breathe it in. So if you give someone who has active COVID with you know, positive PCR a nebulizer, you are now basically aerosolizing the virus. So that was, that was not good. Now, the woman then actually recovered, um, and then at about um, week three and a half, she started developing bruising and ended up getting admitted to the hospital. What she actually had developed were the antibodies that developed from the COVID attacked and uh, took out her platelets. So her platelet count, which would normally be about 200,000, was down at about 10. And anytime they would try to even just draw blood, she would just bleed from those places. Um, so, um, sort of go through a couple things, um, you know, just one more thing to worry about when we, um, you know, have COVID, um, but we have a pre-symptomatic phase. This woman was probably infectious and had a high virus level before she even developed symptoms. Then she had her viral phase, which is when, um, the daughter drove her up to New York. Um, then, um, the trouble breathing, which is probably about what was happening when she showed up in the um, urgent care and got her nebulizer, um, was the beginning of the cytokine storm phase. Um, and I'm just going to, what, what, what is cytokine storm? I was, we use words and, and I think it's important to define them and give their history. So cytokine storm, we did not invent in the time of COVID. Um, it actually first appeared in the medical literature in the 1990s. Uh, it was actually used by a group in Boston in reference to graft versus host disease and the significant cytokine release there. Um, then it ends up in 2002 in a discussion of pancreatitis. And then in 2003, it's actually described in the context of influenza. And it was actually a really nice review in 2007 by Ian Clark. Um, and the N NIH National Cancer Institute actually came out with a nice definition. And this is really, so what is a cytokine storm? It's a severe immune reaction in which the body releases too many cytokines into the blood too quickly. All right, so this hypercytokinemia is something we've gotten quite familiar with. Uh, the recovery trial had that really nice um, outcome with regard to steroids, but we were talking about steroids today, you know, 20% reduction in mortality, you know, but when that 20% is 40% of your patients die, but now only 32% die, yeah, it's a 20% reduction, but um, we still have a third of our patients dying. So um, that was, we're chipping away at the iceberg, but, you know, I don't want people to feel like, well, now if you come in, we've, we've got this mm -hmm. one because we don't. Um, another paper just came out and actually part of the Northwell consortium, it was Montefiore. And um, as I think people probably know, early on in March and April, um, doctors were split. Some doctors were using steroids. Um, some healthcare systems were saying, oh, no, no, don't use steroids, bad news. So there was a split. And so they looked at about 3,000 patients. Um, and they actually looked at some got steroids, some didn't get steroids. And this uh, you know, paper in my stack here, 
um, effect of systemic glucocorticoids on mortality or mechanical ventilation in patients with COVID-19. Um, and actually, it was Maria Keller was actually the ID doc as the first author. 75% reduction in people ending up on a ventilator mm. if they got steroids. Mm -hmm. So just a little more. We're getting, you know, this is not randomized control trial. It's sort of randomized to which which doc, which ID doc was consulting on you probably. Um, so it's just sort of nice seeing a little more um, support to the role. Um, but again, if you give steroids to everyone, if you give steroids to young people who come in, who have no oxygen need, who don't have significant inflammation, you're not being helpful. Um, and they actually showed that in here. If you measured C-reactive protein, sort of an inflammatory marker, people without inflammation, people who are probably coming in a little bit early, you give them steroids, you may make things worse. So again, steroids, certain people, the right time, not for everybody. Um, we're still doing hypercoagulation um, targeting. Um, have a woman right now, unfortunately, who is who's dying on us in the ICU, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to interrupt that progression. Um, but her D-dimer that we've talked about um, is now up 13,000, 12,000. Um, we've actually got her on um, intravenous anticoagulation. We've sort of escalated, and uh, she's prone. She's on high flow oxygen. Um, yeah, not not doing well. Um, and, I, and as you and I talked, not only is there a late hyperinflammatory phase where we see the vasculitis, the Guillain-Barre, now I'll introduce the uh, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, um, so the ITP. Um, sometimes that happens not only with COVID but other viruses. Um, and then there's this, this tail, um, and it looks like a lot of times COVID has a tail. So um, I think there are a number of physicians in the UK who actually are suffering from that tale. So we're seeing um, this be sort of vocally recognized as um, significant and an issue. Um, and so, you know, if, if you see a patient who has this, um, and then the last thing I'm going to is infection control, because as I mentioned, we're starting to do some COVID testing, not just in the drive through urgent cares, but in the office. So um, if you're going to be doing this testing, make sure you wear proper personal protective equipment. Um, for the pro-health physicians listening, I created a nice video. Um, Adam Fitterstein stars in this, and I, I direct it from the back. Um, Stacey Goldberg, our PR person, was involved, and it's a high quality. But, um, you know, if you get sick, you can't take care of anyone else. So protect your mouth. Wear that mask. Cover your mouth and your nose. Glasses are not enough. You need actual proper eye protection, so goggles or a face shield. Um, wear gloves. Wear the full gown. Um, try to limit the time in the room. So go in, get the test. Um, you know, because we don't we don't want you to get infected. Um, as I mentioned, uh, that woman that I spoke to, um, you know, she had three different positives today. You know, and you know, you really want to make sure that one of those um, three positives doesn't make you the fourth positive. And uh, oh, and thank everyone for we are almost here. You know, we've almost reached our goal, Vincent, for the yeah, um, that's great sites without borders.com Fimric uh, support. Excellent. So we're actually only a few hundred dollars away from reaching our goal to be able to support them with a donation of $40,000. So everyone, please go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. We're almost to the end of July and we want to reach our goal. So, all right. Now, Daniel, the woman who drove her mother from Florida to New York, did she get infected? Um, so <clears throat> we don't know, but I'm sounds like she probably did. She did not get <clears throat> sick. Okay. Um, so she's not being, I'm not actually taking care of, did she get infected? When you look at the whole scenario, I'd be sort of hard pressed not to have been infected with. Yeah. All right. I have a couple of questions from listeners. This is from Ian, who is recovering from immune system side effects of lymphoma chemotherapy treatment. And one of his side effects is neutropenia. And he's, okay. he writes, I heard on Twitter that a high greater than four ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes has been associated with statistically worse outcomes for those who are infected with SARS-CoV-2. My ratio is currently in the safe zone, uh, but looking back in past months, it was low. Uh, and he would like to know, um, basically, um, <clears throat> I'm not expecting to shed any light here. I'm hoping for a small summary of how these two components of the immune system work 
and change together in response to viral infection, in this case, SARS-CoV-2. So he'd like to know why we get a rising neutrophil count and a falling lymphocyte count. Yeah, you know, so this will be my plug for I, I'm I'm waiting for a long overdue immune episode. That's it. <laughs> oh, you know, uh, I have to announce that one of our um, co-hosts had a baby last week, Stephanie. So, oh, congratulations, Stephanie! That's fantastic. So that is why we are uh, delayed a bit on immune. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that that is uh, well worth. Well worth the delay. That's a great. That's great to hear. Um, so there is a bunch of interesting issues here. Um, when um, when the human body, when the immune system responds to to certain things, I'm going to say certain things because it's not always an infectious agent. Um, there are several different ways that it can respond, right? And I I think on immune they once um, and actually I think this came onto Twib too. Um, early on, immunologists could count, right? And so they said the first type of immune system was a TH1, so a T helper type one, and, or you could have a T helper type two. You know, a T helper type one was sort of, I'll say, the proper way for responding to intracellular pathogens, so viruses, um, other things like that. Um, TH2, we think of more as an antibody type, and then they forgot how to count and they went right to TH17, and, and then the numbers keep going. Um, <laughs> they bounce around. What, what really happened is they went from um, sort of counting one, two, et cetera, to um, referencing um, them based upon signature cytokines. So a TH17 is a IL-17, um, uh, you know, and so the, and actually one of the significant cytokines there can be IL-6 as we're seeing, which is not really what you want when you're responding to a virus. So what seems to be happening in um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, people who have COVID, is that they're responding in a certain way where they're interfering with lymphocyte survival. So that's the lymphocytes are going down. And there actually was a nice paper that just came out where a group a very small um, number, and, and there isn't as much immunology as I would like, but they were giving IL-7, which is a lymphocyte survival cytokine, and actually seeing that they could raise the um, lymphocytes up. So one of the ways that um, SARS-CoV-2 is doing this is cyto it seems to be cytokine mediated. Um, when you give tocilizumab, when you give steroids, sometimes you can actually see that the lymphocytes start to start to come up. So that's one component. The neutrophils going up, that's actually a broad sort of acute phase reaction against cytokine mediated. Um, so it's a combination of things. Um, some people just follow the lymphocytes and you can do that because you avoids doing any math. Um, but when you see the combination of rising neutrophils and dropping lymphocytes, that ratio actually can be more predictive. Um, so it's 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 really what we're having here is a dysfunctional, improper, non-effective. And one of the nice things I'm going to say about vaccines, right? With a vaccine, um, one of the twibs, um, I don't know if it was Rich or Alan, but someone commented that adjuvants just basically make the immune system angry. Yes. Um, but 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 they make they can make them angry in certain ways. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, and that's one of the things you can in a vaccine not just teach the immune system that there's something that they should respond to, but you can actually um, educate them how to respond. Um, so that's why I'm not as pessimistic about the, I'm actually very optimistic with the ability to make vaccines that don't cause a dysfunctional immune system like we're seeing described here. All right, Michael is a physician who said he wants to ask Daniel, has anyone looked into steroids or tocilizumab on long haulers? I've looked for studies of clinical trials, but I can't find them. Not sure quite how to parse the search terms. Yeah, no. So I haven't seen um, data on this yet, and I'm still um, sort of working through. We, we have a growing number of these uh, people who are still suffering through the tail that I see, and I've described a number of them get better. They have sort of have the trough, and then there's this second hump that they're just struggling through. Um, and so anecdote, just sharing my experience a couple of times, I've gone ahead and done a short course of dexamethasone or prednisone. And I've had a couple of successes where it broke that. Um, I had a woman who, and I think the quote was, you know, after 16 weeks, I finally feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel. And it was, we reached a point and I said, listen, we, we don't have guy, we're in a data free zone here. Um, but I think with the data we're seeing on steroids, you're sort of in the second heat, second 
bump, so to speak, mm-hmm. second hill. Um, and we, and actually a week later, she said, hey, I feel better. And then she's actually hopefully going to be returning to work. I, second individual, again, these are still anecdotes at this point, um, where again, uh, this was an older gentleman. Um, and initially we talked about it. We decided not to do it. Um, but then a week later, he said, yeah, let's let's give it a try. So um, will there be a role? I don't really know. We're still trying to understand. Um, and there are a number of centers that are, are gathering um, large numbers of these patients. And that's what you need. You can't one or two. It's hard to know where they're going to get better either way. Um, as we have a larger number of these and, you know, 10, 100, then we'll get a sense. Um, so at this point, we do not know. So channeling your clinical cases on TWIP, have you done labs on these individuals? Is there anything out of the ordinary that you see? Um, So some of them, yes. Some of them, when they get into that second peak, we actually can see some of the inflammatory markers Mm -hmm. coming up. So, um, yeah. Good. All right. One more from David, our friend uh, and a professor emeritus at Penn State Hershey. And uh, he says there's been recurrent mention that immune responses fade with aging. What about immune regulation? Might it also be disrupted? I know that counteracting immune regulation is an important part of the latest cancer therapies. Are there therapeutics that boost immune regulation rather than reduce it? Such agents might provide a complement to therapeutic immune suppression. As a non-clinician, I love Daniel Griffin's reports. If Vincent is America's virologist and Fauci is America's infectious disease expert, then Daniel is America's clinician. I'm keeping up with the blizzard of TWIV content. The quality remains unparalleled. Stay safe and keep on TWIVing. <laughs> Thought you oh, would enjoy David, that. that's very, very kind. And I would agree that Vincent is America's virologist. Oh, my gosh. No, so many people will be mad at that, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to be mad? <laughs> oh, everyone else who wants to be uh, America's America's virologist. That's why I call I... myself Earth's virology professor. Okay, make it very clear. I'm just a professor. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I I have to say in the in the field of what we like to call what is it edutainment, um, mm. really communicating the science, Vince, and you you've done an outstanding job. And I think you. you got to be honest. I think because of that, um, you know, thousands of lives will be saved. So, so fantastic. So. I, I echo, David, I echo um, your sentiment. A lot of respect for what Vincent continues to do here. So keep it up, Vincent. Right. Stay healthy so you can keep it up. Right. Let me answer this. Um, you know, there are reasons to to be optimistic um, during COVID, as many reasons as there are to not be optimistic. Um, our understanding of immunology is still really crude um, and particularly crude when it comes to what we do therapeutically. So when I see a study where, oh, we're going to give interleukin-7, we're going to do something to the IL-6 receptor, when I see us starting to do real sophisticated immune modulation in the clinical setting, um, I think that bodes well for the future because most people get over infections because their immune system handles it properly. And so it's that percent of people where the immune system doesn't respond properly. If we can actually learn from COVID-19 um, how to modulate and have people respond properly, um, I think we're really going to make, uh, this will be one of those leaps forward. Um, you know, the way NASA brought us forward in a lot of ways. Um, I think that the way HIV brought us forward in a lot of ways in understanding the immune system. Um, I think that we're going to come out of this with a much better understanding of the immune system. And not only are we going to be able to treat COVID-19, we're going to be able to treat a lot of things better. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of good information is going to come out of this, although maybe not immediately. It's going to take some time and maybe even after we've got uh, vaccines controlling things, but I agree with that. Yeah. And I would say even clinicians, right? When was the, when, you know, when did clinicians discuss cytokines? They, no, their yeah. eyes yeah. would glaze over and now they care. Now they're like, I saw this paper about IL-7, you know? Right. This, this is so that physicians are getting more sophisticated. The science is getting more sophisticated. So um, the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train. It's um, going to be increased understanding of the immune yeah, system. That's right. All right. That is your weekly COVID-19 report from Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. Good I'm afternoon. I'm looking out my window, and it's gray. Yeah, it is. It's been raining. Uh, but the temperature is rather uh, humane for a change. Instead of being in the high 80s, 
it's in the low 80s, uh, upper 70s, I forget which, but uh, it, at least it doesn't, you don't mind going outside. You've had a stormy week here in New yeah. Jersey, New York yeah. area. Yep, yeah. yep, yep, yep. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, 84 Fahrenheit, 29C, and uh, about 51% humidity. It's actually pretty nice. Do you um, have clouds? Storms moved through. Got some clouds, uh, sort of overcast, broken, mm. um, but um, but not bad. Dixon, can you move your, your mic the other way? I'm sorry I made you move it up, but now it's catching <laughs> it's your okay. nose it's down, quite all right. down all the way down below your chin. Try that. No, you don't. You don't have to actually bend down yourself. <laughs> just bend well, the, the mic, mic isn't going the, any further. So I'm gonna have... <laughs> <laughs> yes, so master. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> How's, How's that? Is, well, we'll see as you breathe. You know. <laughs> you know what? I could just. Yeah, you could mute. <laughs> but then you'll forget to unmute when you talk. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brienne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, same weather here, seventy-nine and gray. Um, but that's all right. It's much better than 95 that it had been. 79 and gray. Listen, Listen, last year I was 79 and gray, but this year I'm 80 and gray. <laughs> and joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 94 degrees, uh, headed for 97, mm, partly cloudy. Nice Texas summer day. A little rain in the forecast for tomorrow. We could use that. And uh, just uh, the briefest of summaries, um, the caseload continues to decrease in the Austin metropolitan area and is on the decline in Texas in general, though there's a few hot spots remaining in uh, South Texas. So, you know, we're doing better. Good. I noticed that TD8 is on the way towards Texas. Do you know about that? TD8? No. Tropical Depression talking? 8. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife keeps track of that. I'm uh, I'm kind of out of the loop on that one. But you probably they they don't reach Austin, do they? Maybe you get some rain. Uh, it's got to be pretty uh, serious stuff to get all the way up yeah. here. Okay. So, Rich, do you have a take on where the cases are occurring in Texas? Exactly like Padre uh, Island and that sort uh, of thing? yeah, uh, uh, near the Brownsville area is uh, Brownsville. And, and along the Rio Grande. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, typically the areas that. Um, don't have the resources okay yes uh, that's, right. Uh, that's right that's where there was a dengue outbreak in brownsville right yeah yep right yep. on the, right on yep. the border so it's, yeah so it's mostly south texas and and the rio grande where the hot spots are Got interesting it. very interesting all right so we have some uh, brevia for you today first i want to read a letter just came in from jamie just in case you guys mentioned Fauci's wild pitch on the podcast, I wanted to pass along how a caller to a local Boston NPR radio station explained it. Quote, Fauci just doesn't want anyone to catch anything. End quote. <laughs> I love Very that. Good. Very Excellent. good. Excellent. Take care. I'm loving all the COVID-2 coverage. Uh, apparently he was on some baseball game, right? Yeah. He, hey, he opened the, the season pitch. for Washington. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and Dixon, you said he he threw it wildly, right? It was ten feet off the mark, to and, the left. And did he, if did if he, Al Euchre, uh, who was in a lot of funny movies, also a baseball player, by the way, good sense of humor, as an announcer, he would have said just a little outside. <laughs> <laughs> and did he like react in any way, or did he go like? That? Are you kidding me? It's Fauci. Oh, he just walked off. He just walked he off. Says, just, Look, I throw him. I don't catch him, okay? <laughs> for Tony, it's just another data point. Just exactly, <laughs> data exactly, point. exactly. All right, exactly. good for you, Tony. Very good. All right, so uh, the first... Um... Well, well, he was trying to flatten the curveball. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> he was, indeed. All right, I want to... Uh, we have two things to talk about. The first is a... Story that broke some time ago, but Norman had written about it. He wrote, here after a Washington Post f uh, Freedom of Information lawsuit is the State Department memo about the Wuhan BSL-4 lab, which started the accusations against the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And he had sent the document, a link, but it didn't work. So I said, you know, can you send the actual document? So he sent it to us, sent it to me, and I sent it to everyone. And we've had a look at it. And they, he sends a link also to a Washington Post story, which talked about it. Um, and so here's the Washington Post 
State Department releases cable that launched claims that coronavirus escaped from Chinese lab. John Hudson and Nate Jones, July 17th. And um, in May, Trump said he had seen evidence that gave him a high degree of confidence that the virus originated in the lab. When asked why, he said, I can't tell you that. I'm not allowed to tell you that. Uh, and a few other links. So he said, if, it would be interesting if you guys would read the memo and news accounts and give your opinion. Okay, and then he gives some interview with uh, with Pompeo and Martha Radatz, but we'll come to that uh, later. So I was looking forward to a juicy 20, 30, 40-page document with lots of details. Boy, this is really disappointing. It's pathetic. Um, You're absolutely right. It's an unclassified State Department document. Um, it is dated— So much for the I can't tell you that. It's unclassified. <laughs> I mean, a good, the thing is, guys, parts, <laughs> that's you know, right. I, parts of it are redacted, and I presume that's where people's names are. Yeah, yeah. it looked like that to me. And this is dated um, January 19th, 2018, right, from the American yeah. Embassy in Beijing. Yeah. So this is two years before we had anything yeah. going on with this virus. And so uh, here, let me give you some highlights. It's quite interesting. And summary and comment, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has recently established which what is reportedly China's first biosafety level four laboratory in Wuhan. And in a moment, we'll talk about what that means. Um, but um, they, what they say is, you know, they hope the lab will contribute to the development of antivirals and vaccines, but its current productivity is limited by a shortage of highly trained technicians and investigators required to safely operate the laboratory and a lack of clarity in related Chinese government policies and guidelines. Okay. Then there's a big redacted part. And then the next part, there's a little bit of history of SARS, right? Between November 22, 20, 2002 and three, there was an outbreak of SARS in China and uh, 37 countries. Um, and the incident convinced China to prioritize international cooperation for infectious disease control. And one aspect was China's work with a French BSL-4 lab to build their first uh, BSL-4 in, in Wuhan. Uh, and the construction took 11 years and $44 million, which is a good deal for a BSL-4. <laughs> I think the one in Boston cost a lot more. Construction was finished on January 31st, 2015. It was accredited two years later by the China National Accreditation Service for Conformity Assessment. Four floors, 32,000 square feet, and it is operational for research on class four pathogens, although Jens would say there is no class four pathogen. There are things you have to work on under class right. four condition. And I would just, um, I would comment on the price um, being lower. Bear in mind that they're paying Chinese wages on Chinese real estate um, and it's all going to be cheaper. And this is a national project in a country that has spent the past 20 years making large infrastructure projects the core of its thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so building a building in China is no big deal. Um, and 44 million, that sounds, sounds about the right ballpark. So nothing, nothing yeah. amiss in any of this. Yeah. It's not funny. That, it's funny you should mention that Alan, because the, uh, the three gorgeous dam is at uh, risk right now from huge floods that are going on as we speak in China. That is, that is a project of a different caliber. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So then there's a section called unclear guidelines on virus access and a lack of, a lack of trained talent impede research. All right, so um, in, in addition to accreditation, the lab must receive permission from the National Health and Family Planning Commission, which is a weird commission to give permission to work on highly contagious pathogens, but there you go. Uh, and according that's, to— I gather that's like our HHS, but yeah, family, well, family say, planning yeah. in there because that's been a huge part of Maybe. China's China. public health activity. So, uh, to date, they, the Wuhan lab has obtained permission to work on three viruses, Ebola virus, Nipah virus, and a strain of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever found in the Xinjiang province. Despite this permission, however, the government has not allowed the institute to import Ebola viruses. Therefore, scientists are frustrated and have posted, pointed out that they won't be able to conduct a research project with Ebola viruses at the <clears throat> new four lab despite of the permission. And I must comment that the the writing here was presumably done by an American, right? And it's particularly bad, despite of the permission. Anyway, now well, there's— Well, okay. These, now, these, are, these are career uh, State Department people. They're yeah, not they writers. Be, they should be able to write, though. 
They but don't we learn like that in, in school, Alan? One would. Well, <laughs> anyway. I'm so we just, learned that in my class. Yes. We pick on it. Anyway, there's a big redacted part. And then they say, thus, while the lab is ostensibly accredited, its utilization is limited. Okay. Then someone noted this, whoever this someone is, uh, that the new lab has a serious shortage, and that whoever it is is redacted of highly trained techs and investigators. And then they start, they quote the University of Texas medical branch Galveston, which has a BSL-4, which Rich and I visited. And I presume that whatever is redacted is someone from there who may have commented on that. Mm -hmm. Um, they have collaborations with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which may help alleviate this talent gap over time. Reportedly, researchers from Galveston are helping train technicians to work in the BSL-4 in Wuhan, <clears throat> establish gold standard operating procedures, training courses, and as they point out, China's building more BSL-4 labs, so this is important to do this. Okay. Then this section, this section to me is what was ignored completely by everyone. Despite limitations, Wuhan Institute of Virology researchers produce SARS discoveries. And they go over to say, despite limitations on the four, uh, they have recently published the results of a five-year study where they sampled bats in the Yunnan province with support from NIH and several Chinese funding agencies. The results published in PLOS Pathogens in 2017 showing that SARS-like coronaviruses from horseshoe bats in one cave have all the building blocks of SARS coronavirus. And Pandemic they, SARS coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the uh, results strongly suggest that the uh, highly pathogenic SARS coronavirus originated in this bat population. Most importantly, the researchers showed that various SARS-like coronaviruses can interact with ACE2 and infect human cells. This finding strongly suggests that SARS-like coronavirus from bats can be transmitted to humans to cause SARS-like disease. Now, from a public health perspective, this makes the continued surveillance of SARS-like coronaviruses in bats and study of the animal-human interface critical to future emerging coronavirus outbreak prediction and prevention. Um, now, this is exact, this is the work done by, in part, EcoHealth Alliance, and we talked about this. Their NIH grant was suspended by the administration not too long ago to do just this work, which in this report says is really important, right? Yeah. Do you guys note that? Isn't that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so the, the report, this cable is providing background, providing more background, providing more background, and then winding up to this pitch, which is not a wild pitch, where they're saying... This is good research going on, despite the limitations of this brand spanking new lab that's the first of its kind in that nation. They're able to work on these SARS-like coronaviruses, and they've already made progress on that. And that is something that's going to be important for predicting the next pandemic two yeah. years ago. Yeah. I mean, and the only thing in this is that they have a shortage of personnel. Where... Where I've got to say, looking at that, okay, so two years ago when they had just built the first BSL-4 lab in the whole freaking country, they've got a shortage of trained personnel for a BSL-4 lab. Gosh, mm -hmm. what a surprise, right? I mean, of and course they've got a shortage. They don't have a lab like this already. Yeah, why would they have already had why such personnel? Why would they personnel? have already trained? What would these people be doing? And they're working with one of the best BSL-4 labs in the country at Galveston to train personnel. Um, the whole thing about the, the regulations, you know, they're, um, one arm of the government is telling them they can work on these viruses and another arm of the government's not letting them import these viruses. It was like, this could have been written about the needle, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, how many, how many layers of government did they interact with and get contradictory answers? This is just the way governments yeah. operate. That's totally normal. Um, and there is no indication anywhere in here that the short staffing is causing any kind of a safety problem, especially since they can't even work with a lot of these pathogens because they're sorting out the regulatory stuff. This is all completely like, yeah, this is where I would have expected that facility to have been right when they when they finished building it a couple of years ago. Yeah. And they're already doing productive work and go them. The uh, needle that, uh, for the listeners, the needle oh, that yeah. uh, Alan That's the National refers Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratory in Boston. Right. So, um, 200. Alan, this is a document obtained 
via a Freedom of Information request. Is this a public document now? It is. So I can yes. post a copy of this and it Absolutely. would be— Absolutely. Well, I think the Washington Post already did. All right. Because the, the link was broken that he sent, and I wondered if it had been taken down or something. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the, the Washington Post already published this and its and the associated stuff so i'm pretty sure you're fine to put this online and okay. it is it is public information as a result of the post having pushed their their foia request and i must say there's nothing here that sh shows that the virus came from a lab at all oh gosh no oh, not and at all. Uh, if anything it says we need to do this bat sampling which has been suspended by the uh, yeah. current administration which is crazy um, yeah so, so it says I, as I read this this slim three-page document, I was struck by how completely opposite it was from what the White House had said. And then I was I realized that I probably shouldn't be the least bit surprised by that at this point. For sure. Now, one thing I don't understand, maybe one of you do, uh, SARS, SARS viruses are BSL-3 need right. to be worked on in BSL-3 conditions. So why right. does any of this matter anyway? It doesn't. <laughs> BSL-4 is irrelevant. Yeah. Yes. So the three, and I presume they have a BSL-3 at the Wuhan Institute of Virology as well. Sure. I would presume uh, so. Because they do it Needle in Boston. They actually have BSL-2, 3, and 4. Yeah. Uh, so I presume they had one there. And so this is irrelevant in my view. Okay. Right. But maybe they require BSL-4 in China. Is that possible? Uh, I, they, they do say at the very end, uh, of that, let's see here. Yeah. 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 Um, the last sentence, uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists are allowed to study yes. the SARS like coronaviruses isolated from bats. They are precluded from studying human disease causing SARS coronaviruses in their new BSL four lab until, uh, permission for such work is granted. Um, so that's a little, um, you know, it's a little ambiguous in a way, because if you're allowed to study the viruses from bats, I, I guess the presumption is that none of the viruses coming from di directly from bats are going to mm. infect humans. Uh, and I don't know what the regulations are in China, but in the U.S., uh, SARS MERS, that is SARS-1 and MERS, and SARS-CoV-2 are BSL-3 pathogens. Okay, so from that perspective, at least, the BSL-4 lab is irrelevant. Yep. And so, yeah, and the presumption that uh, viruses that they are finding in bats will not infect humans and cause human disease is not necessarily a great presumption. Right. Um, so continuing with Norman, he said, here's the interview with Martha Radatz in which Mike Pompeo first says he agrees with the experts who say the virus was man-made and then says he also agrees with the experts who say that it was not. And the title of this, it's a YouTube link this week on ABC. Uh, China's coronavirus response was a, quote, classic communist disinformation effort, end quote, Pompeo. So this is part of Redats. Mr. Secretary, have you seen anything that gives you high confidence that it originated in that Wuhan lab? Pompeo, Martha, there's enormous evidence that this is where it began. We've said from the beginning that this was a virus that originated in Wuhan, China. We took a lot of grief for that from the outset, but I think the whole world can see now. He said Wuhan, not the laboratory, right? Right. Remember, China has a history of infecting the world. They have a history of running substandard labs. These are not the first times that we've had a world exposed to viruses as a result of failures in a Chinese lab. And so while the intelligence community continues to do its work, they should continue to do that and verify it so that we are certain. I can tell you that there is a significant amount of evidence that this came from that laboratory in Wuhan. Radatz, do you believe it was man-made or genetically modified? Pompeo, look, the best experts so far seem to think it was man-made. I have no reason to disbelieve that at this point, and I'd like to see what best experts because none of us think it was man-made <laughs> and many other or people or anybody no. else uh, any other no. best no. experts that i know of Radatz, your office says of the dni says the consensus the scientific consensus was not man-made or genetically modified <laughs> pompeo that's right i i i agreed with that yes i've <laughs> i've seen their analysis i've seen the summary that you saw was released publicly i have no reason to doubt that it is accurate at this point 
Okay, just this is Redats again. Okay, so just to be clear, you, you do not think it was man made or genetically modified. Pompeo, <laughs> I've seen what the intelligence community has said. I have no reason to believe that they've got it wrong. <laughs> I'm glad I'm Go a back scientist. and read 1984. He I'm, doesn't even need know what his story is. No, yeah. he doesn't. Know doesn't need to know. And he, as, he gives you both answers. He's a great yes. politician. No. In adjacent sentences. <laughs> So we have gone over many times while there is wonderful evidence that this virus came from nature. There is zero evidence that it came from a laboratory. So I just wanted to go through this. There's nothing there. And finally, I asked uh, Ian Lipkin if the Wuhan BSL-4 lab was adequately staffed, because as you know, if you listen to his uh, COVID-19 interview, he worked very closely with them and has high respect for them. He said, I commented on this earlier for the Washington Post wasn't a problem when I visited three years ago. Right. And that's someone who has very intimate connections. He just returned early this year, you know, just before he became sick. And, I and, and in fact, to, to be clear for people who haven't seen that episode, he returned earlier this year, tested negative for SARS-CoV-2, and appears to have picked it up in New York City from what he could tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... And, you know, uh, uh, what's important is that he caught it somewhere outside... Um, because, um, you know, they as were working, as he could tell, they were working on his lab and they, they could tell by sequencing it. It wasn't his lab isolate, right? It was, right. It was right. something else, which is really oh, right. important yeah. in terms of that. I thought you, when you said outside, I thought you meant outdoors no, yeah, um, outside of his laboratory, outside of his laboratory. Yeah. So it wasn't in Ian's lab and it wasn't in China at all. Yeah. He caught it somewhere around the city. And I want to, uh, reemphasize that the Wuhan lab and the scientists there are really outstanding. Yes. And from the get go have been uh, totally forthcoming uh, with this whole thing. R recall that the uh, sequence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 was deposited in GenBank and made available to the entire world mm -hmm. on January 10th, long before, I believe, uh, there were any uh, cases outside of China, giving everybody ample opportunity to get on top of this, yep. okay? Yep. Uh, and with respect to this whole thing with uh, how uh, the administration has played this, I've been thinking from the get-go, but haven't had the opportunity to actually say it. Weapons of mass destruction. It's the same thing all over. Yes. Uh, Rich, you want to briefly explain BSL two, three, and four? Yeah, very briefly. I think we ought to uh, we can make it brief and maybe stick a link in the uh, show notes for those uh, new listeners that we have who are not familiar with these terms. Uh, research on uh, potential uh, pathogens uh, in the U.S. and internationally. The the terms and uh, classifications vary somewhat internationally, but in the U.S., uh, there's a, mm, a classification that's biosafety level, and there's biosafety level one, two, three, and four of uh, increasing containment, where BSL-1, uh, biosafety level one, basically means there's just no danger, and you uh, do whatever you want. Well, let your kids then, work on it. Yeah, well, suitable yeah, suitable right, for right. the undergraduates. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's pro progressive containment uh, uh, through BSL-4. Um, BSL-2 can be done in a normal laboratory and is mostly procedural. You got to keep the doors closed. You got to uh, use biological safety cabinets and there, but it's by and large procedural. Uh, BSL-3 uh, all of the um, participants are suited up uh, in uh, personal protective equipment and uh, breathe from ventilators, and the laboratories are specifically designed uh, to minimize the possibility that anything will get out. Of course, there are other procedures. And BSL-4 is uh, what people are familiar with from the horror movies of uh, people running around in uh, spacesuits. And uh, I want to uh, just point out, and then, of course, uh, what happens is that pathogens are classified as to whether or not they can be worked at at these various levels. And so, for example, as I already uh, said, BSL-3 
uh, in the U.S., uh, you can work on just as a couple of them. SARS-CoV-1, that's the original SARS, SARS-CoV-2, and MERS-CoV. Uh, and BSL-4 is stuff like Marburg, Ebola, Lassa fever, um, Crimean Congo, hemorrhagic uh, fever, uh, and etc. In general, the characteristics of BSL-4 agents include that they're highly lethal. Yes. Uh, and so you and, can read through this document. And not and, treatable. Yes. You can read through this document and see what the criteria are uh, for working in the uh, various levels of containment and um, uh, also see what sort of uh, pathogens are worked on in the various levels. BSL-4, one of, the, one of the problems with BSL-4 is that if you classify a pathogen as being BSL-4, it really limits uh, what you can do because there aren't all that many BSL-4 laboratories. So while it's important uh, uh, to have that uh, classification and that availability, it's important to mm, use, it uh, use it judiciously. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, right. It, it okay. drastically restricts the number of labs that can work on those agents. And the work itself, as you if you can, uh, Vincent's going to link to the video for, um, for TWIV 200, which is... Uh, very professionally shot. Um, we, we pulled out all the stops on that. You can see us in bubble suits um, for a little bit of it too. Um, and, and the work in those labs is a pain in the butt. I mean, the whole, it, compared to BSL-3, you got to gown up, you got to gown off when you go out and, and there's some procedures and all that, but uh, and usually kind of an airlock to get in and out. But BSL-4, I mean, it's just layer after layer after layer of protection and you're you're all suited up and gloved up and moving around in this space suit and um the um if you want to if you want to work with an animal model um the procedures for that are really just extremely cumbersome so the work itself becomes a lot harder too so i wanted to uh, reiterate that uh relative to the issue that we've been talking about the uh, only criticism of the Wuhan laboratory was the availability of trained people they needed for their to do BS some more hiring to scale up. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. their BSL four lab, and the BSL four lab is irrelevant yeah. to the SARS CoV two. And that's as of two years ago. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's th threading the needle. Rich, me, and and Alan in the suits with the the air hoses. Here, you can just see one here, and this is a great video. It's like a. Uh, um, Let's see, it's a 50 minute uh, video. There's Paul Dupre suiting us up there. All the tubes hanging down from the ceilings where you would get your oxygen from, right? And right, then so the, the facility had not opened at that time, which allowed us to walk in street yeah. clothes and film inside what was what is now a very highly contained. Yeah. Place. Hey, look at I'm that. We, we are putting on our suits there and walking through yeah. the chemical. Well, we're all there. Anyway, check it out. We'll put the link for that. Uh, in the show notes, that was a great opportunity to be able to do that. Um, you guys look so young. We were. It was a long time ago. <laughs> yes. You know, time time passes, right? And uh, and that's time it. Time passes. All right. The other thing, the other story I wanted to talk about. Let's put this up, Alan. We learned on Wednesday that it's pretty fun to put up the uh, papers and let people. Uh, Nice. Follow along. This is a preprint at BioArchive. It's a story we talked about, but here are the data, which are quite interesting. Oh, this is also really good because and now I can just focus on the Zoom window. And you don't have to look at your... Uh, I don't mother. have to go yeah. scrolling back and forth. This is great. From, pe from people to Panthera, <laughs> national SARS, natural SARS-CoV-2 infection in tigers and lions at the Bronx Zoo. And uh, so now it's presumably submitted for publication somewhere. And you can see all the authors here. The first author is Denise Macalus. And I have highlighted here Paul Cali, who's the head of the whole shebang, all of the wildlife thing in, in New York, which is the head of all the zoos and aquaria and all that. And he was on TWIP. Remember Dixon? I do. Dixon. And you can see all these people. The many penguins. With the penguin. Oh, that's another great video where he's sitting with the penguins. It's so cool. Yep. Uh, of course, we have the Bronx Zoo, we have Cornell, we have the USDA in Ames, we have uh, College of Vet Medicine at University of Illinois, CDC, uh, the, the zoo in Chicago, apparently, um, the New York State Department of Agriculture, and the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Oh, we have two first authors, so let me, let me mention them, Denise Macaluse and 
Is it? The, is that the second one? Melissa too? Leverack. Is that Melissa? Yeah. Oh yeah, the little spike. Melissa. Oh, we have. Look at all these. Melissa oh, and Lei Wong and Mary Lee <laughs> Killian. Those are all four co-first authors. And the last is Diego Deal. So uh, they, they they missed an opportunity with their short title. It says uh, tigers and lions and zookeepers. Oh my! Oh, they they oh could my. have easily gone to lions I, and tigers and zookeepers. Oh yes. my! Oh yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, could be Brianna, a title. Oh, too, but, <laughs> could be slow. a title. Well, that would, uh, good slow. show title: lions and tigers and zookeepers. Oh my! Oh my! <laughs> Put it up. Yeah. All right. So uh, you can see now. If now, I'm sorry. Uh, if you're listening only and you miss this, but we'll try and describe things. But I highlight the things I want to talk about. In the abstract, I have one word highlighted, strains. It says, whole genome sequence shows lions and tigers are infected with two strains. They are not two strains. They're <laughs> genotypes or isolates. They're not strains because a strain has some biological difference, and we have no evidence that this is the case. But I understand that you know not everyone is facile with... Um, What's the word we use? Pedanticism. <laughs> and and I, I will point out that in the lab, we used to use that term pretty casually as well. You know, you, yeah, for sure. Any mutation you made, because you have to distinguish the individual viruses you make, and we would just call those strains. I but must say also, is, Alan, when you were here, casual use. when you were here in the 90s, right? Yes. I was far less pedantic then. Yes. Only writing a book in TWIV have gotten me more pedantic, for sure. So as you know, uh, because we've discussed it here on TWIV, uh, we have seen documentation of SARS-CoV-2 infections in dogs, cats, farmed mink, Hong Kong, Europe, China, and the U.S. And uh, those are natural infections where they've acquired them. Experimental studies have shown that the virus can uh, reproduce with high efficiency in cats, ferrets, and fruit bats, poorly in dogs, pigs, and chickens, and ducks are off the hook. They do not seem to produce <laughs> productive uh, virus infections. And so here is a story of tiger and lion and zookeeper infections in the Bronx Zoo in March 2020. And uh, this is, um, you know, New York at the time was just becoming an epicenter for transmission. So in March, four-year-old female Malayan tiger. Now, unfortunately, they don't use their names here. Remember, one of them was called Nadia. <laughs> I guess they wanted to be serious. Developed an intermittent. Well, I mean, they they didn't want to have a HIPAA violation, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> an intermittent cough and audible wheezing despite remaining eupneic. Now, I would love to know what a coughing, wheezing tiger sounds tiger. like. I've never heard that before, right? Um, I've seen a wheezing. Don't, you don't want to hear it either, Vince. No, you don't want to hear it because usually it's behind you. I wonder how close you have to be to hear it, right? <laughs> You know, because I guess the the handlers get very close to the to the animals. We had we had a cat um, previously that had asthma, and its wheezing was very audible around the house. So yeah, I sure. Can't assume sure. that a tiger oh, wheezing is too bad. Pretty easy. Uh, to hear. By April second, an additional Malayan tiger and two Amur tigers housed in the oh. same building, but in different enclosures, and three lions in a separate building got similar respiratory signs. Otherwise, they were fine. These clinical signs, and oh, that's the other thing I wanted to point out. They use the word signs, which is perfect because the tigers and lions can't tell you what they're can't feeling. Can't tell you what they're feeling. Which would be a symptom. Perfect example of that. They resolved within a week and all but tiger one, whose signs lasted 16 days. And there was one other tiger in the same building who did not develop <laughs> clinical disease. And, and it's sort of interesting here that... Um, the tigers were in the same building, but different enclosures, and the lions were in a different building. And it makes you think about how was this virus transmitted between these animals? Yeah. Um, you sort of assume it must be the zookeeper. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. So they did some radiography, thoracic radiography. So which then brings this picture of this huge cat, which I has, I guess you have to anesthetize and lay on the I table. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is why it's not so easy to do this routinely, right? But I guess if you have a sick animal in the zoo, you have to see what's wrong with it. Uh, they showed small lesion, regions of peribronchial consolidation, and uh, they looked at this under the microscope. They did some tracheal washes, necrotic epithelial and inflammatory cells consistent with tracheitis and inflammation of the trachea. And then, this is great, they did in situ hybridization. They took some of these cells and put them on a slide and hybridized them to 
a nucleic acid that they could then see if there was if it was binding to something in the cells, and they they picked up SARS-CoV-2 RNA within these necrotic cells in the wash fluid, and then they did PCR for all the common feline pathogens, all negative, and then I guess someone decided to check for SARS-CoV-2, and they were all positive. And it, you know the interesting part here, which I think is cool. They use the CDC's test, but then they have their own in-house homebrew, which we can't use to diagnose people. But in the in a zoo, I guess it doesn't matter because these sure. animals have no HIPAA rights. <laughs> <laughs> they have no hippo rights either. Right. Yeah, this is that, interesting. A nice way to see all the ways that vets should still know some molecular biology. Oh, yeah, for sure. Fecal samples collected opportunistically, which means... I guess you go in the cage after they... Uh, yeah, well, cage cleaning, yeah. You don't actually say, can I have a sample, Nadia? Uh, they, found, uh, <laughs> they found virus in those as well. Okay, so this is all by PCR so far, but what I think is really cool is they attempted virus isolation in one of these other labs, I'm sure not at the Bronx Zoo, because you need a BSL-3 lab for that. So they took these washes or fecal samples. Of course, they filter them to remove bacteria, and then they put them on cells and plates in the lab. They use Vero cells, which are from vervet monkeys, right, Brienne? That is correct. Brienne got me uh, thinking right on that, I must say. <laughs> vervet monkeys. Uh, they're, they're kidney cells that are commonly used, and they saw cytopathic effects, which means the virus is killing the cells and, or altering them in some way. And also, uh, and actually, they got a figure of that later in the paper that we ought to look at so that people okay. can see what cytopathic effect Let's actually see. looks figure like. Let's see, figure 2A and B. Now, here's the thing. We have to scroll all the way down. That's figure that's, 1. That's an annoying thing about PDFs of yeah. papers. All right, here's... Uh, you can just open a second window, dude. Yeah, I could, but I, then I'd have to share the whole desktop. Right. I'd have to redo <laughs> it. Where is the... Um, you had it there, right, right, right there. there. So uh, on in oh, A, that's oh, an yeah. uninfected cell monolayer. Oh, and on B, so nice. that's uh, one that's been infected with virus. And you can see that the virus uh, makes the cells round up and get really refractile yeah. and pull away from the dish. It's making them sick, dude. It is. It literally curl up to die. Yep. If Cytopathic you, effect. Viruses that make you sick. If That's you, why. Uh, if you came in that morning and looked at these under the scope, you'd go, wow, we got yeah. virus. So yep. exciting. Yeah. Right. And then they do immunofluorescence. Let's see. C is the in situ hybridization. So the red is where the probe, the nucleic acid probe, is hybridizing with uh, SARS CoV 2 RNA and cells. And it's in the cytosol, the nuclei are stained right. blue. So this is not a virus that goes into the nucleus. And then, indeed, we have immunofluorescence using an antibody to a viral protein. And then a second antibody, which glows red, and you can see lovely um, red um, fluorescence here, right? Uh, or is I it the, the green? I the green. The, yeah, it's antibody's green. green. And red is the counter stain, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I was being um, hopeful that all these cells were infected. All the right. <laughs> so there you go. All right, so that is... Okay, so that's cool. It's SARS-CoV-2 for sure. Um, let me go back to where I was. Fecal samples, neutralizing antibody. All right, epidemiology. So we had 10 zookeepers and two managers who provided care for and had close but not, not direct contact with the tigers and lions in this time. Not direct contact. That's important when you're working with tigers and lions. You can't this touch them, That's it's right. Just, that's right. And this time, at this time uh, in March, uh, the... the um, March to April, the, the zoo was closed for obvious reasons. And they, they of course, interview these individuals and four staff, two tiger and two lion keepers. What do you do for a living? I'm a lion keeper. Right. <laughs> Reported mild respiratory symptoms, fever, cough, chills, myalgia, fatigue. Yeah, between March 20 and 28, which would correspond to this period. So they collected oropharyngeal samples, blood from these staff members. They tested them by PCR and an immunoassay for antibodies. Uh, all the other staff had no symptoms and were not tested. Uh, but the tested keepers had evidence of current or prior SARS-CoV-2 infection. One RT-PCR positive tiger keeper, keeper one. One RT-PCR and serologically positive tiger keeper, keeper two. And two serologically positive lion keepers. And they said, we got sick and we stayed home. But I guess they weren't sick 
while they were shedding some virus initially, and maybe that's how they transmitted it. They were pre-symptomatic. Then they got nine complete genome sequences from this, four from tigers, three from lions, and two from keepers, and eight full-length spike gene sequences, seven symptomatic and one asymptomatic from all these samples. So now you can look and say, what came from what? So these um, were compared to the Wuhan virus sequence, and all of these from the tigers and the keepers had six single nucleotide polymorphisms and nine additional ambiguous changes. Total of 20 sites differed between the three lion sequences and Wuhan uh, isolate number one. And these can be put into clades. You know, the tiger and tiger keepers clustered with clade G, which is defined by a spike substitution, which we've talked about, D614G. And the lion sequences cluster with another clade, clade V. Um, and you can see that these are closely related, these virus, but they have distinct features, right? And they think that the tigers and lions were infected by uh, two different isolates, two different viruses, at least two independent introductions, one in tiger and another in lions. Which goes to Brianne's point that the most likely way the virus got into these two different buildings was through the zookeepers, probably different zookeepers. Yeah. <clears throat> The genome from Tiger 1 was identical to the sequence from Keeper 1 and to the other human strains, uh, isolates detected in New York City at the same time. So, you know, so here we have a virus identical in sequence to what's going around in New York City. And so that's where it obviously came from. An infected Keeper to Tigers, whether it was direct or indirect, for example, fomites, food handling and preparation, or subsequent Tiger to Tiger transmission, right, droplets, we don't know because we don't, for the lions, we don't have a clear uh, association and transmission source. But And um, they were not putting masks on the cats. No. Interestingly, um, some of the SNPs were uh, also found in isolates from nearby Connecticut, and I'm sure some of these individuals might have lived there. I know Paul Cowley does, <laughs> but I'm not blaming you, Paul. Don't worry about that. <laughs> the keepers, not the tigers. Keepers. There you have it, mainly. Um, and then I've, I have highlighted here at the end a couple of things. Um, these infections occurred at a time before testing was widely available in the U.S. Also, uh, well, we're still in that time, aren't we? Yes, we're, it's not as widely available <laughs> as it should be. They also preceded the CDC guidance for recommending face mask coverings, which was issued on April 3rd to limit transmission. Keepers did generally not wear protective personal protective equipment, given the historical low risk of disease transmission between humans and domestic or non-domestic domestic felid species. And so because of this study that they did at the zoo, they uh, developed new protocols for PPE when keepers are taking care of the animals. And that includes not just cats, but mustelids, viverids, and chiroptera. But mustelids are... Um... <laughs> Minks and weasels and chiroptera are bats, bats. or viverids. Dixon, what's a viverid? Viverity. Someone's looking it up. I am. Uh, viverity. I do not know. I thought you knew all this stuff, Dixon. Uh, yeah, but I've forgotten it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The first thing I saw was small to medium sized mammal, which is really yeah. Not they're helpful. these um, it doesn't help much. Nope. Civets. 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 Ah, cats. Half, half retractile claws. They're not cats exactly. They're these -like. cat like yeah, yeah, tree raccoon dwelling. Dog. A raccoon dog would that trying to find a. Um, yeah, I've got a list, and basically there are they're all civets. Yeah. Um, or the bincherong. Interesting. They have civets at the Bronx Palm Zoo. Palm civet, otter civet. Sure. Palm, yeah. Dixon, let's um, go see them. Okay. I, I, I presume they're still closed right up there. I don't know. That's a good so uh, they're uh, implicated because they have been fingered as potentially intermediate hosts in other SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. aren't they still looking for the bridge between the bats and humans? There may not be one. You know, it, the, the one has not been identified. There may not be one in this case. I thought the sequence was so far apart that there had to be something else. Well, either that or it's a different bad virus. 
Oh, exactly. So the two possibilities, there's a there's a bat virus in the, right. in right. the so the Wuhan field field surveys where they sampled SARS viruses in bats. Um they yeah, right. got a bunch of them and there is <laughs> one that's that's a lot like SARS CoV two, but not enough like it to have been the direct ancestor right yeah, in the humans. Right. Um and the possibility is since there are still so many bats out there and since they could only sample a limited number and since sure. you know at least the US has canceled their funding now, um they <laughs> there's quite possibly another SARS virus out there that's still in the bats that was the right, actual right, right. direct precursor. Um, or it went through an intermediate species that we have yet to identify. As a brief moment in time we considered the pangolin, but that that didn't not to really that doesn't really tangle it out. No. But it didn't tangle. Yeah, but it, uh, uh, if from that I knew what a pangolin was because yes. they're right. pretty cool. They're pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. They if, are. If cool. you read Ed Young's book, the whole prologue is about pangolins and really? their pictures. Yes. No kidding. When I was in uh, South Africa, I actually got to see one. Hmm. Where in South Africa? Yeah, it was at a game preserve called Sabi Sands. Hmm. I will have to look out for that next time I'm in South Africa. Uh, please do, because I, I actually said, they said, is there anything else you'd like to see? And I just blurted it out. I said, well, we haven't seen a pangolin yet. The guy gets in the walkie-talkie, and the next thing you know, we're driving over to the place where another group had seen a pangolin. And there it was, burrowing its way into the ground, trying to escape from us. But it was clearly a pangolin. All right, let's do some email. Uh, we have two here which refer to a uh, the International Space Station <laughs> sighting, right. uh, which I mentioned last time. Mark said on the last TWIV, Grumpy was wondering about seeing the ISS overhead. That's me, I guess. But we, Yeah, we, that's you, Vincent. And apparently NASA has an email alert for that. It sends you an alert in the morning for when you see it. It's visible in the sky for about six minutes, and he gives a link to that. And I love his P.S. Muggy, 30 degrees C here, even muggier inside my mask. And Ronald from Central Florida also wrote about this. He said, finally, a chance to pay you back. When, when the ISS goes over, you can, the sun reflects off it, and it's brighter than any star. You can see it for about six minutes. He gives the same link uh, as well and gives an example of that. Uh, so I will have to check this out because I think that would be pretty cool to see. Um, as I mentioned last time, and I was thinking about this this morning. So uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, and we had a very tiny backyard, and we used to go out and look at the stars. And I remember my father said, the Sputnik is going overhead. It must have been in the 50s because we left Patterson in 1960. And we went out, and I looked up, and I was right. If in the 50s, I'm anywhere between, uh, at the most, I'd be seven years old, depending on when in the 50s. I'm looking up, and there's this white thing moving across the sky. Said, wow, look at that. And it could have been an airplane for all I know, but he said it was the <laughs> Sputnik. That's I, right. That's I trust right. that he was. He knew what he was talking about. So thank and you for that. For so any, I have any a, radio I... operators who are listening, there, there are apps and websites that you can get um, the, the track on the space station that'll give you not only the times it'll be overhead, but azimuth and eleva elevation to aim your antenna. So you can huh. try and contact the astronauts if they happen to be on cool. the air. Very cool. I have a, an app on my phone that I've had for a while called uh, Go ISS Watch, something like that. And it uh, it includes, it's got all kinds of stuff for tracking it, but it, importantly, it's got a little calendar so that you can uh, predict what's going to happen and try, you know, figure out the best time to go out. It is very cool. It's worth watching. Because speaking of space, I have Star Tracker on my phone. And the coolest thing is you look at night, you say, oh, what is that? And you hold it up. And the other night I saw a bright light near the horizon. It was Jupiter and Saturn really next to each other. Oh, it's so cool. Those big giants. What, Dixon? Nice. What do you want, Dixon? I can't hear you. You're so, muted. So with both hands there were and a five... you can find Uranus? <laughs> please, <sighs> please. But -da boom No, there was a time, I think that same night, you could have seen all five planets that you can see with your naked eye. Naked eye? All in the sky together. Now that's cool. Yep. Um, so that's cool. Thank you. Uh, by the way, finally, last space thing. <laughs> we actually interviewed an astronaut on TWIV. Oh, okay, yes. you so probably good. don't know that because a lot of you are new. Um, but I know my son was showing me YouTube videos uh, you know, in the space station, they do all kinds of cool things. I didn't realize they brush their teeth and swallow the toothpaste. Oh yeah. Because you can't spit it out. He said, it's a mess if you try and spit anything. Out. It's true. And how you exercise. But, and I showed him the astronaut, 
Yeah. Yeah. If okay. anyone is interested in Rubens. that, Kate um, Rubens. I remember being blown away by her discussions of how she had to put together some of her protocols and how sometimes she had to lock her feet into pipette because she would get a backwards motion um, from the, out, the recoil from, from the recoil and she would fly across the room it was so cool this is uh, K- kate rubens yep. and it's twi- twiv 44 Four. Five, twiv 444 444 yeah and astro kate the right stuff and there's a oh, video four, four. so she was just great she was yeah really she cool. was awesome but she was telling us rich you remember I wasn't on that show but it, it was it was an awesome show yeah i was in the audience it was great she was talking about how when you pipette you know counterintuitively if you put a pipette against the tube the water just slides down the tube and she said have you seen the video of this astronaut uh, where he takes a washcloth and he saturates it, and then he washes, and the water just coats his hand because of the surface tension. It doesn't go yep. floating off. It's so cool, so cool. <laughs> Looks like a scene out of Terminator. <laughs> yeah, it does. What's actually. that? What's that? Just uh, kidding. Just kidding. One, yes. <laughs> um, all right. So I think it's appropriate that Rich take the next email. Okay, Rich writes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Twiv. As a retired veterinary pathologist who taught viral pathogenesis at Tufts Veterinary School for 30 years, I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying your podcast. One thing that makes me laugh is uh, your oft-used term, herd immunity. How in the world did a term like that get entrenched in today's scientific jargon <laughs> after years of terminology like epidemic versus epizootic endemic slash enzootic, et cetera, et cetera. Supposedly making clear distinctions between human and animal disease. <laughs> Wouldn't population immunity have been more consistent? <laughs> anyway, here's my question. If people over 50 years of age infected, um, infected with COVID-19, what he means is infected with SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2. often develop more serious disease and this is presumably because of a diminished immune response, immunosenescence. Why is dexamethasone so effective in preventing many of the deleterious effects of the virus? The comparative effects of dexamethasone on humoral and cell-mediated immunity are likely not well known, but I would ex- suspect the drug would dampen immune response in both limbs. Incidentally, are you familiar with the discovery of synthetic steroids by Russell Marker, an analytical chemist who began his work studying the octane ring? He subsequently developed uh, the octane rating system. <laughs> In 1938, he proposed a new molecular structure for sarsapogenin, a plant glycoside, which when degraded by removing most of the atoms in the side chain resulted in a steroid ring subsequently converted to cortisone. Mm. Uh Mm. Nice. And he's a um, DVM PhD and a few other American college of veterinary pathology. Pathologist. Pathologist. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he's a diplomat of that. organization. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I can't really comment on what I would predict of dexamethasone or what it does. Anybody? Well, I, Brian, you want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, this is Brian. <laughs> Take it, um, Brian. <laughs> so I would say that the uh, we're, when we think about the immune system, there's sort of earlier and later responses. If you have your immune response is too low at the beginning. Um, when you are infected, then the virus is going to do a lot of damage. Um, And so that might be what's going on in uh, people over 50. Um, But in other people, there is um, damage because of excess immune responses, and the dexamethasone would stop those excess responses. And that excess is probably a bit later. Yeah. So glad we brought an immunologist on the show. Yeah. (laughs) Very helpful. I I think population immunity would be a better word. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Of course it would be, yes. Yeah, but that's not it, it, what's logically better is not always what ends up being used. No, it's right. like social distancing versus physical distancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, it would mean I wouldn't be able to ask multiple choice questions on exams where I ask what herd immunity is and I always have one that's like immune systems of cows. Mm. Yeah, Brienne, why don't you take the next two? All right. Helen writes, longtime listener, thank you for supporting teachers. Yeah, we are. Why wouldn't we? <laughs> Thank you for being teachers. Thank you for being teachers. Yeah, good point. Thank you for listening. Yeah. 
Um, and Raphael writes, sunny and hot, 90 degrees under siege in Portland, Oregon. The Olympics. I plan to go with my son this year, but oh well. Am I making it next year? If you were consulting with the Olympics, what would you suggest happen to make the highest likelihood this, that this could go forward? Consider having a virologist from Japan on your show in the future. Thank you, Raphael. When are the Olympics? Fund vaccines. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. Uh, they were supposed to be this summer, and they have been moved to next summer Yes, in Tokyo. Close call. Right? We've already canceled ASV for next uh, yeah. year about the same time. Not happening. Not that many, I, that I many think people. If, you're, if you really want to be safe for everybody, uh, all bets are off. Make it the next year. Yeah. I mean, it may be okay in Japan, but the Olympics involves a whole lot of people from all over the world That's coming the in. And so how do you make sure that every country in the world um, has stopped? I'm, I'm actually then? pretty optimistic that we'll get a working vaccine sometime next year. Probably. I mean, that's an optimistic projection. Um, and summer, yeah, it seems realistic. There'll be a working vaccine. There'll probably be millions of doses of it available in the developed world. Um, and probably decent, but not total coverage in big countries like the US uh, and China. Um, uh, but if you're going to bring people from all the Olympic competing countries into one densely populated city and I mean, and, and what, what we're expecting for the vaccine is that it's not going to be a one and done deal. This is probably going to be get one, get a booster a month later. You know, that seems like the most likely scenario. Um, so it's not like you could just have somebody waiting at the airport to give everybody shots and then that would take care of it either. But, um, but nobody asked I, us. <laughs> yeah, but nobody asked us. So we, if we were giving advice to the Olympic Committee, if people from the Olympic Committee are, are listening, uh, be prepared to postpone again. Right. Well, you know, so many efforts that we've made along the way on this to predict what was going to happen have been wrong. Yeah. I think you got to yeah. go with what you know now. It's, it reminds yeah. me of right. uh, reminds me of advising my students on submitting an abstract for a talk at a meeting. I would say you don't submit an abstract unless you got the data right now. Okay. And if more data comes up in the meantime, you can talk about that, but yeah, otherwise you're committing yourself to the, the, uh, an uncertain future under promise and over deliver. Yeah. Right. So Vincent, Vincent um, mentioned once that he's hoping that eventually they'll develop a 10 minute test, a 10 minute uh, PCR based test that, You've got the virus, or you don't have the virus. Ooh, so my, who, who are you talking about? I didn't suggest that, but Michael Minnis said I, a ten-minute antigen test, not PCR. Okay. No, an antigen test. Okay, fine. But how soon after you catch the virus does that test become positive? So it. Uh, you should l listen to what Daniel Griffin just said. You know, a I, few minutes ago. <laughs> The problem he, is that the test is recorded ago, separately, and we don't actually have access to it. <laughs> no, we show. don't. Just in so case anybody's wondering why we <laughs> they all seem to forget <laughs> what Daniel just said. As yeah, as okay. you, no, no, so Daniel, Daniel just actually, said <laughs> he, he actually went through the levels of RNA that you can detect with PCR and, and okay, when you're okay, symptomatic okay. and so forth. But you know <laughs> the what is quite clear is that you start to shed enough virus to be transmissible a day before symptom onset. Ah, and then it so peaks, five, maybe five days or something. Like and that, then it though. peaks a day after symptom onset, and then rapidly declines. And Michael Minnis said, within seven days, you're no, if you're a, if you're a mild infection, or uh, you're no longer transmissible. Um, maybe even just two to three days. Of course, if you're very sick, then you may be making more virus for a longer period. Did you have a question associated with that, Dixon? I did because I mean, I imagine you've got uh, 150,000 people waiting to get into a stadium. And each one, let's say, has to be tested right now. Oh, yeah, it's a big problem, a logistic problem. In fact, I, I was... I think uh, you couldn't do it. I don't think you could ever do that. So I was... I, I was uh, it. No. So speak, talking of listening to advice. So I actually was asked to be on the local committee to decide how the schools are going to reopen in my little town in the fall. So we had a meeting Wednesday night. And they do not want to have... So the kids, as they get off the buses or get out of the cars and go in the school... They don't want to have to do things like temperature checks because it would take too long to get them Correct. in school. It would take I an hour. Just, I just had this uh, this discussion. Our local school is going through the same thing. And in Massachusetts, the state level 
plan that they've distributed, which all the towns are going to have to comply with, uh, basically says nothing about testing. Yeah, that's right. So the plan is, and they're, <laughs> and they're telling they're telling districts to develop three plans. There should be an all in person plan. What are you going to do for containment if everybody's in the school at normal population? Um, a an all online plan. Schools are closed. It's going to be online just like it was this spring. And how are you going to change your lesson plans to fit that? And a and a hybrid plan where half the students come Monday, Tuesday, half the students come Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday's a disinfection day. Um, and and they're they're coming up with all that. And so you know he's the superintendent spent about a half an hour going through all that. And it was a live YouTube thing, and you could submit your questions on chat. And I said, "What kind of testing are you doing?" And the answer was none. none. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what right. I learned. Um, exactly. In so many words, he said, we're relying on the local board of health to report if there are cases. Yeah, no, no, I, we had the same thing. In fact, my meeting, they said, we are not allowed to test in school. If there's any testing, it should be at home. Because I said, you know, we, we might, might at some point have these one minute, one dollar, 10 minute, one dollar tests. And they said, well, that would have to be done at at home. You could be allowed yeah. to test at school because we can have governors issue executive orders to allow such things. This is true. But uh, you remember, Alan, the more you test, the more you find. Yes, the more you find. <laughs> no, I mean, I understand from the school's perspective, this is a huge logistical and financial challenge, and they don't feel they have the staff, and they don't feel right. they have the capability to do this. Um, <laughs> but my feeling as a virologist is if you if you feel you can't do the testing, then I feel you shouldn't be opening the schools. You should be going with the all online plan. And I know sure, sure. as a parent um, of God help me, a teenager, um, <laughs> you know, this is not my preferred option. I, I <laughs> do not want my kids spending her entire no, no, no. Uh, ninth grade year sitting in the house. Um, no. But if the alternative is to send her into a school environment, where we have no idea how many asymptomatic spreaders are walking around in the hallway, um, then I don't think this split schedule is going to do a whole lot to, I, I, I'm, I'm not optimistic about how that's going to play so out. One way to alleviate teacher anxiety, and there is a lot of that, by the way, yes. is to let the students stay in the same classroom all day and the teachers move to the room. It's one of the many things that they're discussing is is how to limit the types of hallway interactions that are normally yeah. happening and and all that um and you know kids are gonna take their masks off and they're especially at certain teenage levels um they're not gonna have a whole lot of regard for the rules um and it's sure. i know uh, Tough. and yeah the teachers the teachers are they're freaking at out. Extraordinary risk because yeah, a lot of them true. are, you know, middle age, middle age, and or more or in some cases, and and even if they're not, they're certainly not in that uh, in that privileged uh, yeah. elementary age group that doesn't it's seem true. to get sick much at all. Um, and and this one risk is puts them at uh, risk of infecting their families. Yes, um, correct. Like some other risks that they might have to. Yes, take. and absolutely and the. The data we have on schools, I mean, people point to the study in Iceland where, <laughs> oh, it didn't get to the schools. It, it right. was fine. They kept the schools open. But Iceland shut down their epidemic instantly. Correct. I mean, they they found they had a case and they're such a small yeah. country and so well funded and so organized yeah. and unified. And they believe in science. And, and they believe in science. So they just said, oh, we had a case of this pandemic virus. Let's line up the entire country and test everybody. Correct. And since we have national health care and everybody's health records are electronic, I mean, there was so much that they could do there. That's right. It's right. just not happening. All right. Here. I'm moving to Iceland. Yeah. Well, or New Zealand. I would pick New Zealand probably because of the better weather. I don't think they would let me go there. <laughs> they have, no, they won't. Not now. No, but oh, maybe no, right now. Have, we can't go to any of these I'm talking, places. I'm talking about in two two years when this is all over. Because yeah, yeah. I'm I, I sort of had it almost with the U.S. in many ways. Anyway. I think uh, New Zealand has a restriction on grumpy people. <laughs> they do, actually. <laughs> we do I have, think you're supposed uh, to stop being grumpy when you move there. But do, I think if right. you move there, you have to take a whole lot of money. We do have... Um, Yes, listeners in New Zealand, I know this, yes. and maybe they'd like a, a science podcaster who's grumpy. Who knows? Oh, they would love it. They would absolutely you know, love it. I could be the Howard Stern of virology. Really, really <laughs> oh, grumpy. No, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> yeah, I think you should stay with 
being the Vincent Racaniello of our Oh, so he's he not a good thing on. to emulate? No, I don't no, really no. know. He just, no. I thought he was grumpy, no? No, he's a little over the top. He's okay. a little too grumpy in the wrong yeah. ways. Howard Stern is uh, All right. off the wall. Dixon, can you take Philippe? <laughs> Philip? Philippe. Philippe writes, hello, Twiff team. Congratulations to you ladies and gentlemen. You bring great insight into this period. Um, I believe episode 640 followed by 641 are putting Twiv in the spotlight. How does it show in your statistics? It should show anyway. Oh, you're putting all kinds of words in there, man. That's okay. He's getting it. He's just, just let him go. go. It should anyway. It should anyway. Uh, be proud to inform all people, hairdressers, plumbers, carpenters, L and D specialists, myself. What's an L and D specialist? Uh, learning and disability, yeah. something like uh, that. Okay, fine. I was um, thinking labor and delivery, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, up to date and speed with science. You do not take us for fools, and you are right. I took the first nine lectures on virology on the virology course and intend to finish during my holiday. He was referring to Vincent's virology course. I am able to discuss SARS-CoV-2 with pharmacists without looking stupid and even challenging them with your insights. Congratulations. Keep the good work up. I put that in there. Philippe. And then he shows a graph from uh, the downloads. Well, that he doesn't show it because he has no access to He has it. no access well, to that. Vincent has pasted he, in a graph. Okay, 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 okay. So not only do I add words, Vincent adds visuals. Uh, okay, so I thought uh, I would put this in. This is a graph of downloads. This is just the audio from, um, you know, the beginning of May through the current date. And you can see, well, first of all, whenever we release an episode, there's a spike and there this, is. You know, the spike is twenty to 30,000. And now the, the big spikes, the last two episodes, the big right. spikes are um, Michael Minna and Tony Fauci. And then the other, the one behind it got a little of the, <laughs> you know. It got the twiv bump. Got the twiv bump. <laughs> it got the Tony <laughs> bump. <laughs> but, you know, those are over 30,000 down, which is just on the release day. And then you get more and more. as it, So, yes, we have seen a bump, although... And YouTube is doing very well also. This Tony Fauci video I just looked was 27,000 views, which is nice. But here's – let's put it in perspective. I Please. follow <laughs> I follow a lovely YouTuber named Marcus Brownlee, who's a tech uh, video guy. He's really very good at explaining uh, tech. He reviews things like cell phones. I know him because – he went to Stevens Tech and my son, and he went to Stevens, and my son overlapped with him so much, so forth. Anyway, so he released a video this week. He reviewed a cell phone. Within 24 <laughs> hours, it got 1.6 million views. So maybe we need to review cell phones here on Twitter. Well, no, no, the can thing, we piggyback onto his? <laughs> the thing I've discovered on a much, much smaller scale, just with my own blog, is people use the internet extensively for quick how-to advice yeah, yeah. and true. and like minor day-to-day -day decisions. Uh, the most popular page on my website for the past like 15 years has been a post that I put up years ago about how to renew your ham radio license. <laughs> <laughs> it has gotten thousands and thousands of hits because people Google that and it turns out I've got one of the top pages on the internet telling Whoa. people how to do this. And yeah. Okay. Well, you should make a video on it. You get even more hits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be, I'll be going viral on YouTube, but um, I mean, it's thousands of hits. It's not millions of hits because you don't have millions of hams, but, no. um, but this is just, that's the nature of the No, beast. I understand. We're, and, and to be fair, his production values are exemplary. He shoots in, you know, 4K video, right. his lighting. He's got a studio downtown, and I always wanted to go there one day and say, hey, interview me. <laughs> <laughs> so I can get some more views. Or just give it to right. me. Just, it's I, a, it's I amazing. It's amazing. And, and you you're know, not going to get in the millions of views with a two-hour show. No, no, no. Anything. I agree. But, I mean, you know, he has great angles on his – he does a lot of cutting sure. and so forth. I understand I just, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's a either, increase over where we were. Yes. That's fine. But I still think we could – we should be over a hundred thousand. This is a well, cell you know, I, it's not, it's not <laughs> there a you go. <laughs> what what the, matters is not how many people were reaching, but ooh, which people were. That's reaching. right. That's right. Uh, here, I have a, a new mouse I just bought, and I really think it's cute. Don't you? Oh, that's adorable. Oh yeah, it's very nice. That is adorable. Right? It's, it's, it's a Keith Haring edition, I think. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a little portable thing. 
Where so you're doing a mouse review and how to boost our viewers. I'm trying that's, to get uh, yeah, to, that's worth a half a million views yeah, right there. Trying to get views. All right. So uh, uh, just to just to correct and be precise, L and D is learning and development. Learning Thank and you. development. Okay. Alan, could you take the next one, please? Sure. Lib writes, hello, Twiv. Thanks so much for the wonderful podcast you've been doing during the pandemic. Um, you know, we were doing it before the pandemic, too. Um, <laughs> I'm a biostatistician at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in downtown Chicago, so I've been keeping very busy with COVID-19 research, and it's great to be able to listen in on updates instead of having to search for them myself. I'm currently working on a serology study of our hospital workers, all of whom were offered a free serology test, and over 6,000 agreed to participate in our study, sharing their serology results and answering a brief survey concerning COVID-19 exposures, illness, etc. I would love to send you our paper once it's done. Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> however, for now, I'm mostly writing in about two small things. First, I have something to add on the guinea pig comment and the possible mandatory trial of a new um, COVID-19 vaccine in Chinese military. My roommate and good friend was in the U.S. military for four years from 2009 to 2013. While in training during the fall of 2009, she was given a mandatory vaccine for swine flu, H1N1. All military personnel were required to receive the vaccine. In fact, they're required to receive many vaccines, including some very invasive ones such as smallpox and anthrax. I'm including links to some articles, including a 2007 AMA ethics article concerning informed consent in the military. While the H1N1 vaccine was FDA-approved, FDA and this is, of course, a huge difference to a mandatory trial, I do have one more thing of interest to add. My roommate reports a superior officer gleefully told her and the other mostly teenage military recruits that they were guinea pigs for this new H1N1 vaccine. An, import, an important uh, thing to remember is that our military is not a paragon of informed consent. Second, I have a story about this after I finish the letter, too. Uh, second, concerning the offhand comment in TWIV 642 about hot coffee dropped in one's lap, this is undoubtedly a reference to a famously misunderstood, yes, 1992 case about a 79-year-old woman, Stella Liebeck, who spilled McDonald's coffee on herself. <clears throat> Provides a link concerning the case. I believe I'm guilty of that because it's really kind of a meme, and I do know that it is a complete mischaracterization of the case, and I apologize. Uh, some of the important facts pulled from Vox article about um, Adam Conover's show, Adam Ruins Everything, and their episode on the case. By McDonald's policy, their coffee was at that time heated up to 190 degrees Fahrenheit, which caused extensive life-threatening life third-degree burns to Stella Liebeck's legs and genitals. All she asked for was McDonald's to pay her $20,000 medical bills, which they refused. So she took them to court. She ultimately settled from $600,000. McDonald's then began changing how it heats up its coffee. Uh, from the Vox article, this was an incredibly rare care case where a working class victim actually beat a huge team of corporate lawyers and made the world a better place. So how does the public's view of this case get so warped? According to Conover, lawyers spent years running a disinformation campaign, which much of the media bought into, holding up the McDonald's coffee lawsuit as an example of a supposed epidemic of frivolous lawsuits. So a quick reminder that while, yes, frivolous lawsuits can happen, many supposedly frivolous lawsuits are made out as such by smear campaigns funded by the world's richest corporations. While vaccine risks are certainly complicated and the public image of them is particularly bad right now, to our society's great detriment, I highly doubt vaccine manufacturers are exempt from this media bias against normal people asking for restitution from corporate harm. Thanks so much again for all you do. <clears throat> mm. uh, yeah, so this was in regard to the vaccine court's um, comparatively small payouts, um, but those are based on calculations of actual medical costs and help limit the liability from what would otherwise be um, business-ending settlements, potentially. Um, and the, the volunteers in the military thing, actually, my, my stepfather um, had an experience with this himself. He was, he was in the U.S. Army, um, not by his own choice, but because his father signed him up because he thought his kid was about to be a juvenile delinquent, and so um, instead enlisted him in the Army. And, and frankly, having heard Al's stories from his youth, he probably was about to be a juvenile delinquent, so it was a good thing. Uh, so then having been volunteered for the army when he was 18, he went to basic training. And at the end of basic training, um, the drill sergeant uh, was going down the list of who was assigned to what. And so-and-so is going to the infantry and so-and-so else is going to the infantry. And uh, Griffith, congratulations for volunteering for the Airborne. Um, so he ended up in the 82nd Airborne because based on his test results, they decided they were going to volunteer him for that. Yeah. Presume he had fear of heights. Uh, he was not particularly interested in going into the airborne. Um, 
but that's where that's where he ended up and uh there he had many more stories about the interesting experiences of well that. you know part of the uh, ethos of the military is that you do what you're told otherwise you do what you're told you know, it doesn't yes. it doesn't work if you turn no i'm not going out it, there no if you if you make <laughs> now this this was an extreme this was back in the 50s so you know i'm sure they've reformed some of this especially since uh you probably can't just sign people up for it anymore but yeah um but yeah, you can't have you can't have people just opting out of everything in the military. Yeah. No. All right. Well, I mean, this whole thing of corporations smearing people—I don't know what to do about that. It's not sure. beyond, beyond my purview. Uh, no, but... no. And I and I apologize for for my mischaracterization of that in a in a one liner. My point was that corporations who make vaccines um, are not going to do that if yeah. they if they know that they can be sued and have to roll the dice in civil court and pay their lawyers every single time for every single lawsuit that comes up because yeah. somebody's arm got sore. Um, so the point of the vaccine court is, is not to allow companies to do bad things. It's to protect them from the randomness of that process, which can indeed lead to outcomes that are not necessarily justified. Absolutely. All right, Dave writes, greetings from North Central Florida, where it's a toasty 36C. Is that where Gainsburg is, uh, Rich? Gainesville. Vince, Gainsburg. Get it right. I, I was there. You, you, I broadcasted there for five years, okay? Yes. So, um, <laughs> yes, that's where that we used to say North Central Florida. You even used to say North Central yes. Florida when you introduced I always me. said Gainsburg because I like bugging you. <laughs> and it kind of, a Gainsburger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, I'm not trained at all in your field of expertise. I have a few questions I'm sure will remove any doubt of that fact. <laughs> it's okay. We are all learners. After listening to five months of TWIV, I am confused. So are we. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Please help me understand. When I hear positivity rates and or mortality rates being tossed around, it appears that they are including the total positive test results in the calculations. How can one report any measure which would include qPCR CT values greater than 35 or 36, which represents a measure of non-replication competent RNA? You are not confused. You get it. You listen no. to Michael Minna. Yeah. To ask this question I, I alone. Think, <laughs> yeah, these questions are not, in fact, saying that you have no expertise. I'm not convinced that you have no expertise in this. <laughs> Neither am I. Would this not also potentially have an impact on the number of people being reported as asymptomatic? Dead nucleotides indicates to me a contamination measure or post-disease artifact measure rather than a measure of how contagious a person would be. Is it not true that pesky RNA contamination in a lab is very difficult to control? Just ask the CDC. Yeah, RNA is really a problem, right, Vincent? Yes. It's everywhere. Yes. Yeah. It's everywhere. Uh, so let me just pause and say, yes, um, we are just measuring RNA. We don't know. Uh, and the key from Michael Minow is that oh, now all we should worry about is who is transmissible. And if you're above 35 or 36, there's very little RNA there, as you just heard Daniel Griffin say, in fact. But we can't separate that out in these positivity tests because, as Daniel also said, you you are not allowed. Labs are actually not allowed to report the CT values. I forgot what he just said, but there's a reason. You can, you can only say plus or minus. You're positive or negative. Mm -hmm. You can't give out a CT value because he's been trying to get that from his labs to assess whether they can send someone home, and they will not provide it. I think it's not in the approval of the test or something like that. So, uh, yes, we don't know what fraction of the positive people are actually transmissible. I don't know about asymptomatic because, you know, you could have a low CT value before you become symptomatic. You could have a low one after you've recovered and so forth. So uh, I, I think, though, most of these are true positives. It's not a matter of contamination. Yes, you're, they, they, do, they go to very um, extensive measures to make sure that you don't get contamination. For example, the PCR is done in a lab that has never seen any SARS-CoV-2 or plasmids or anything. It's got to be a completely clean place that is, you know, devoid of, of those sequences. Yeah, your, your comment about post-disease artifact measure is more likely. Uh, it's basically like if you came into my kitchen and looked to see how much flour was around, you couldn't tell if I was making cookies or if I made cookies earlier. Um, there's going to be flour all over either way. 
I was thinking about this the other day about what the what finding nucleic acid means, and I was thinking that you could probably go back to my old house in Gainesville that I left five years ago and swab the place and find my DNA all over the place. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm there. Yeah, you could, I'm sure, in Gainesburg, Florida. Yes. <laughs> I like this um, word, dead nucleotides. <laughs> dead <laughs> nucleotides. It's great. All right, after a review of the literature, it also appears that Michael Minow was correct that many in the scientific community turned up their noses at the prospect of using anything than the gold standard qPCR for testing and links to an article on that and even we turned up our noses at you know the Abbott uh, ready now or whatever it's caused ID now here's an article low performance of rapid antigen detection test as frontline testing for diagnosis and um, unfortunately we we were wrong yeah all right. With what is at stake, I cannot fathom why, even if the government failed us in the deployment of the low-cost antigen testing, where were the voices in the corporate world and universities demanding the production of this $1 pregnancy-type test? My opinion is that the FDA would have to approve the manufacturing and distribution of the test strip because the public and the corporate pressure would be so huge, they would have to cede to the inescapable logic of the benefit of this type of testing performed Frequently, Michael Minna is spot on. At this point, my head rotates 360 degrees above my shoulders, and all that is missing is the pea soup in this horror of a movie. Thank you for all that your team does to communicate what is, and more importantly, what is not the current state of science. Very respectfully submitted. Well, I think we're just right now at the point that he's talking about, where there's yeah. uh, this is yeah. a new a new way of thinking about this, uh, and the uh, uh, public and corporate pressure for uh, on the FDA for uh, accepting a new paradigm, really, yeah. in testing is uh, going forward. And I, you know, the FDA is not the enemy in this. Okay, no. uh, they're gonna they'll listen. No, okay. and this is not a this is not a let's lean on the FDA um, type of thing. It it is true that there may be a point where public pressure will be useful at some point, but the FDA is not the kind of organization that's going to respond directly to public pressure. This is this is the kind of thing where there are already folks on board who are at the FDA or connected with the FDA who are aware of this, who know that the utility of this and the limitations of this and. Um, I, I think the key thing to do now is to get all the people who are advocating this. I mean, Michael Minna makes a very, very strong case for it, and he's right, uh, but he's not the only person who's thinking this way, and we've actually been discussing as the TWIV team on the Slack channel that we have um, that there are a bunch of other people who are thinking similar things and doing similar things, and we're kind of hoping to just sort of get them all in a virtual room together and have them sort out. Sure. how to get this implemented hopefully before my daughter starts school um, like but idea. speaking of which i have to be excused oh um, all right yes. alan, alan dove yep. turbidplaque.com on twitter he is alan dove thank you alan thank you bye, it's alan. always a pleasure bye alan, bye, alan. The, zoom, See ya. the zoom wave <laughs> yeah, I'm getting really i'm getting really used to this zoom stuff it's amazing it's funny at every meeting i wave and everyone waves I, yeah I love so you. people are becoming more human but by the way I do think, so Michael Minna, you know, he did an op-ed in the Times, okay. But I think him talking about it on Twift really made an impact. We have so many people who are taking that message and putting it on. And, good. you know, MedCram made a short video the, about the it. The MedCram thing is really good because it's short and it summarizes the whole thing. And uh, many, many people are listening. And I think this is going to percolate and amplify. And uh, if we played a role, I think this would be great. Yeah, I think that Rich's point is actually really important here. Um, if you listen to that episode, um, we were all sort of blown away and shocked. This is uh, this idea of using less sensitive tests is a little bit counterintuitive to sort of what we often think about um, when we think about virus testing. Yeah. Um, and so I think that one reason why there hasn't been a push before this is because people haven't been talking about it and we're right now starting to talk about it and hopefully this will emerge soon. Yeah, we had this this drive for sensitivity, sensitivity, and that's not it. That's a natural a natural way to approach it. You yeah, know? but you know that that we didn't think of how much virus you need to transmit. We didn't right. think that um, was really the so, key. You know, I uh, I was thinking about you know when you get test results back for a lot of other tests in a laboratory they 
show you a normal range. That's true. And tell you whether or not you're outside of that normal range. Now, you we've been it. thinking about this of, you know, you got to look and see whether or not they have ever had the virus. But, you know, thought of, if we think about it in terms of transmissibility, that imposes a normal range yeah. on the asset. Mm -hmm. And that's sure. what needs mm -hmm. to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich, can you take the next uh, John, John yeah. writes, if fatal cases are highly skewed to the elderly, i.e. nursing homes, et cetera, doesn't that make it difficult to backtrack to the total number of individuals infected? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Am I missing something here? Yes. Yeah, you have to know if most of the cases are nursing homes and those are the ones we're testing how can we backtrack? But we're not just testing those people. We're testing a lot of other people yeah. who are have mild illness and they're younger and they don't go to the hospital. And also we do some random testing of uh, everyone. And I asked Daniel, as you just heard, <laughs> what the fraction is. And he said, we don't know. <laughs> and he said, we just don't know what fraction um, is are just people randomly being tested versus sick people who don't go in the hospital versus who go in. It would be good to have those data. But uh, at the moment, we can do it, I think, because we're not just testing the people who are in the hospital. And we know uh, the fraction of infections that are mild. So you can do calculations based on that. that I think that makes sense, right? Yep. Yep. Why don't you take the next one, Rich? Sure. Anonymous writes, hi, TWIP friends. I have a degree in geology, but I'm currently working as just a transportation planner. That identifies him as a listener. For uh, uh, a commuter railroad on Long Island as we transition through the reopening phases in downstate New York, I've been listening uh, to all things TWIF since March based on a Twitter recommendation by Malcolm Gladwell, by the way. He also recently tweeted the uh, Michael Minna TWIV. It says a lot about the service you folks provide when you count the likes of Malcolm Gladwell as a regular. Uh, you can be assured that I will continue to listen after that is all over. I have a question about the herd. I keep hearing about, oh, I keep hearing about studies that place seroprevalence in various locations, generally between five and 25%. As a matter of fact, I heard on TWIV that Corona Queens is apparently the queen of coronavirus with sixty eight percent. You know All that true. that's you know what that's a reference to, right? That's yes. Simon and Simon Garfunkel. And Garfunkel. Ah. Yeah, Queen of Corona. <laughs> oh, okay. Singing me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Okay. It all comes together for me. <laughs> so my question <clears throat> is what constitutes a herd? Am I part of the downstate New York City herd, 20%, or the New York State herd, 10%? Uh, maybe I'm part of the America herd, which I figure is between, <laughs> say, 1% and 12% seropositive. Given the fact that I work uh, in a major intermodal transit hub, uh, should I think bigger? Do residents in Corona have reason to believe that uh, to have reason to have a rosier outlook, or should they uh, kiss the prospect of herd immunity goodbye? Apologies to Paul Simon. Uh, I'm curious about how to think about this, uh, as well as how to respond to people who point to herd immunity prospects based on a study in one location or another signed anonymous. This is a really good question. That's yeah, great. Okay. It's a great question. Uh, because, yeah, it depends on where you are. Yeah, Your herd so, is but, where you are. And if you travel over a long distance in your daily, the whole area is your herd, absolutely, because you right. could contact so people. It's, and it's you, you're not just part of one herd. You might be part of a couple. Right. You, you can be in the New York City herd and the New York State herd. You right. mean it's Sorry. better to be seen and not heard? So, Brianne, you're in the Madison herd? I'm in the Madison herd. I think you and I are both in the New Jersey herd as well. Well, I come into the New York um but I don't really contact anyone. So no. two days a week, uh, I would say yes. I'm, but even I don't go out of my house, frankly. I don't go anywhere. I stay home. And uh, so I'm in the, the the herd of my home. I don't know what my family, you know, there are four people in my home. Um, no, only my daughter's been tested. So uh, I think we're 0% seropositivity. But you've been tested because you had to go to work in order to get tested, No, right? I always came. I came in always one day a week, so I didn't have to be tested. 
You were grandfather clause. I was grandfathered in because I was considered essential. I fooled them. Oh, so it doesn't matter if you're infected. <laughs> I said I had to change the CO2 and nitrogen tanks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I did. I, in fact, I did two, two, two CO2. I changed two CO2 tanks and a liquid nitrogen today. I have to say, I love doing that manual stuff with wrenches and tubes. Oh, I love absolutely. it. I really, absolutely. I always have liked it. And you know what? If boxes come in, I'm happy to put them on the shelves. I used to work in a supermarket. <laughs> Sorry. Do you still split the helis, uh, Vincent? <laughs> no, I don't anymore. I don't think we have a spinner anymore. Um, wow. a Amy does all the cells. Um, I, I didn't. I did it up until not long ago. But I have to say one thing. I think I did a plaque assay about a year ago. I sat down, and it all came right back. It's like uh -huh. muscle memory, uh -huh. man. Boom, 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 boom. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Not only. Not only that, but I used to find that when I would, uh, you know, sit down in the hood. And, you know, start splitting cells. This sort of Zen. thing came over me. My whole body. Sure. Tell sort me of went, about it. Oh. No, you know? tell me about it. Listen. It's, it's Zen. amazing. It's a Zen thing, for sure. My cells are growing yeah. extremely quickly this summer. It's sort of amazing. <laughs> and it's sad because it's the summer where I don't have any other people in the lab to use them. Um, so if any of you need to split cells, I've got some. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, my favorite activity in my lab was to count worms under the microscope to do the dilutions worms. and then to infect mice early. I, I was I was very good at that. Counting. I actually good. infected mice this week also. On oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, okay. I infected them. Which uh, route? I did some intramuscularly and some intracerebrally. Oh, intrathecal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. I've been doing that for years. I love it. I really, actually, I, I feel kind of bad for the mice, but yeah, I, 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 would too. I do. I, would. I, I like doing these little precise things. Even, no, I hear you. you know, I do. Even though I'm an old man, no shakes yet. Yeah. You know, I'm okay. Sorry. I, I know what you mean. Brianne, go ahead. <laughs> Sure. Braden writes, Dear Twivers, I'm writing from Harare, Zimbabwe, a country in Africa, where the weather is sunny, <laughs> very dry, 20 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I have no idea how much that is in Fahrenheit. The temperature <laughs> measurement system confuses me. I was raised with Celsius. <laughs> 35. I listen to your show while I clean the house and would like to thank you for keeping my motivation high to create a hygienic environment in my home. Wait a minute, Dixon. It's not 35. 20 is... No, what is it? 68. It's Celsius. 20 Celsius. It's, 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 it's like room temp. Than, it's yeah, 68, it's room yeah. Temp. I meant to say room temp. That's exactly I'm, right. I'm, I'm rescuing you from comments, from angry comments. Okay. Right. <laughs> so that's about, that's about 70. 70, 72, something like that. Yeah. Right. No, no, I'm totally, absolutely right. I only have a Bachelor of Biology. Double majored in plant and human bio, third class pass, no honors thesis. It's 68. I'm sorry. It's not 70. It's 68. Uh, whoops. Good. Thank you. If if, I'm sorry, Brianne. If, if Kathy it's were okay. here, she would fix you. <laughs> oh, I totally agree. Uh, so I only have a bachelor's in biology, so I will defer to your superior wisdom. I am sorry that this question is distinctly grosser than the four-year-old's fart question. <laughs> My roommates and I all got an infection in January that our respective primary care physicians deny is COVID-19 without referring us for antibody testing, despite us and our cat and dog having all the symptoms of a long-term infection, complete with gastroenteritis, from January to March, or the middle of our summer, which is statistically improbable for a regular flu infection. We're all experiencing symptoms consistent with the after effects of covid poor pulmonary performance, increased joints, pain, et cetera. Our respective doctors and our fur baby's vet argue that the virus has only existed since March, so we couldn't possibly have had it. They refuse to listen to your show because Dr. Google doesn't know better than me. Is there a connection between sharing a bathroom with someone and sharing immunity? Specifically, if SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> can stay on smooth plastic surfaces for a few days and someone with an active COVID infection poops in a toilet that's in the same room as a toothbrush, flushing the poop without closing the lid, spraying a plume of aerosolized fecal matter onto the toothbrushes in the room, can those toothbrushes then transmit the virus? <sighs> Alternatively, is this fecal plumes landing on toothbrushes a potential explanation for the results out of Strasbourg, regarding outpatients cohabiting contacts developing immunity. If the guts of actively infected COVID patients have antibodies and they 
defecate <laughs> within the range of their roommate's toothbrushes, does putting those toothbrushes in our mouths spread immunity? I've tried to get my roommates to close the lid before they flush. Am I trying to make evidence to support my opinion on lid down flushing? Or is there a case to be made for thoughtlessly spraying poo, poo. On, detritus. People's, <laughs> detritus on people's toothbrushes being a way to spread disease? Our town has annual outbreaks of cholera, dysentery, and typhoid. So toothbrushes as a transmission medium is relevant outside of this pandemic. Physically distant regards, Brayden. Mm. What, Graham, what do you think about getting antibodies from fecal ingestion? I don't know about get, I'm not sure about getting antibodies from fecal material. Yeah. I think that spreading pathogens that way um, might make a little more sense, but I don't yeah. know about antibodies. I mean, that's it, my the, area. The um, <laughs> the uh, the amount of vir infectious virus in the feces would have to be quite high, right? And mm -hmm. and it's not always very high in the feces, so. I think it's a low-risk transmission scenario, but there have been fecal plume infection outbreaks for SARS-1 for sure, mm -hmm. and some for this one, so it's not out of the question. But I think it's uh, not common, is my understanding. However, yeah, you should you should close the lid. You know, Kathy yes. Spindler has told us she's in uh, you know public bathrooms where there's no lid. She flushes and gets out really quickly, <laughs> <laughs> which I could just see because you know in an airport there's no lid. What That's do you right. do? Although in some countries there are lids because they think about this, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. in terms of some of your other um, microbes here that you're talking about, um, I would very much recommend closing the lid, um, though I don't have any specific evidence for SARS-CoV-2. All right, uh, Dixon, you got a long one here. Can you handle this? I don't. I'll try my best. If you poop out halfway through. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll close the lid. All I'll, right. I'll take over someone. With, uh. <laughs> no, I'll close the lid. Joshua writes, hello, and thank you to all I admire at TWIV et al. Thank you, Vincent, and thank you to everyone. I do not expect this to get to being read anytime soon, but I thought it time that I spend some time writing a thank you for what you do. Feel free to jump down to the bottom of this email to get to the main point. I won't do that. Yet, I am an assistant professor at a at Detroit Mercy Dentac. That's a dental school in Michigan. I had the distinct fanboy pleasure of meeting Dr. Schmidt at an American Dental Education Association meeting last year, getting to say, "It is good to put a face on a voice." I have been listening. To, it's good to, to put a face on a voice that I've been listening to since grad school. I am trained in bacterial pathogenesis, but have been immersing myself and falling in love with virology as I have been teaching viral infectious diseases to dental students. I want to send a sincere thanks to you, Vincent, for posting your lectures, as it has been wonderful to continue learning and adding to my formal graduate training in virology as I continue learning how to teach as well. I have been working from home and trying to connect with students in this time of remote instruction and Dr. Schmidt's appearance on TWIV was timely and wonderful for my own information and also to give my students another resource to see what getting back into the dental clinic will be like. That episode came at a time when Michigan was getting ready for phased reentry and our school was in plans to reintroduce students into the COVID-19 era of dentistry. Also, trying to follow your lead of getting out good information. I, along with my colleagues, have been doing questions and answer sessions for our students and faculty for the most recent information on the pandemic. On a separate note, I have been compelled by the efforts and time commitments from everyone involved in the different TWIVs. I forgot the term, I forgot what the term to refer to them all as a Twixes. Yes, I have begun venturing back into social media. It is not an easy task to try and put good scientific evidence based posts and take the time to deal with a lot of the difficulties associated with that. However, your collective dedication to promoting good information has instilled in me the desire and motivation to continue trying. I must say that if it has paid off, I have gone through responding to people. Uh, that just like to bring up conspiracies or talk about headlines without any sound supporting information. Your examples have shown me how to do it constructively, and I have a newfound respect for the fact that it is just easier to believe something you are told without facts, and that we as scientific community can be a voice of reason that most out there just do not have the right source. 
we can all be that source and do it in a positive and productive manner. And it is most definitely worth the time. We can all learn something that is process as well. I think the most jaw-dropping jaw -dropping moment for all of this has been the episode with Michael Mina. It was a listening as I got ready for another day of working from my home office with the kids running in and out and going crazy, which honestly has been great, but much better than working an hour from home every day and not seeing them. I felt utterly shocked at how much sense all of this made. I have been in discussions with in the community about schools reopening, and my wife is a teacher, and nothing has felt good about even without the testing. Then this interview just blew me away. I felt so much better and even more convinced when I heard Rich, Brianne, and Vincent expressing the exact same feelings. Even as a young investigator who still has a bit of an imposter syndrome, I felt that I was validated in hearing you all feel the same way as I was. I sure do love the ramble, but what scientist doesn't? Thank you for thank you so much for what you do. I hope you all I hope you know your efforts are reaching people. I have been posting episodes on social media and that I led to my construction management foreman brother posting a huge post about the Michael Mina episode. Cool. I told him, if you do not listen to anything else I tell you, listen to me now. Go and listen to that episode. He did. He posted. To quote the beginning of my brother's post, long read here, but give it a minute. Give this podcast a listen. The first 45 to 60 minutes is all you need. Put it on one and a half times and it is done before you are done mowing your lawn. Don't worry about getting lost in the acronyms. Just know these people are among the best in their world. When several of them have their mind blown by one, <laughs> maybe we should listen. Just one more. Thank you so much for your dedication, all of you. You are all selfless, and the scientific community is indebted to you and should learn from your efforts. I have learned so much and will continue to do so. Best to you all, and thank you again, Josh. And he teaches at a dental school, so this is uh, very, very uh, appropriate and very nicely done. Thank you, Josh. It was lovely. Yeah, we yes. were blown away by Mina, and I think people liked the fact that we said we were blown away right there, and they said, yeah. wow, it must really be true. <laughs> we're, being, right. we're being ourselves. We're not acting, right? I'm really great letter, I'm, great letter, Josh. And I everything you say about um, we can be the source um, for people, I agree with uh, wholeheartedly. That's why we do it, even though I do misread it every now and then. <laughs> you know, I don't have any sense of dedication to this i love it <laughs> right, you know? yeah. i just you know no. it's effort it's effortless yeah i feel like i'm every day i'm here i'm lucky to be here yeah exactly you're all fired i, I would agree <laughs> really <laughs> no no we're fired up can't fire you i, I don't my, pay you i want i want I, after this sort of accolade i want my salary doubled okay exactly we'll negotiate. i didn't mean to bring that up all right we have to negotiate one-on-one -on -one. all right Really? <laughs> All right. Jenna, <laughs> Jenna and Joe Wright, dear Twiv team, we are probably outliers among your listeners, as I am an opera singer and my husband is an opera conductor and composer. Wow. We live in That's Santa great. Fe, New Mexico, where it's currently 531.67 degrees Rankin or Fahrenheit, 72 Fahrenheit, LOL. We had to look up the Rankin conversion. <laughs> we were introduced to Twiv by a friend after the COVID pandemic started. We have become passionate fans. We have lots of time to listen since our entire industry has ground to a halt for the time being. We always wear masks, distance ourselves from others, and mostly stay home. I don't know if you guys heard that the Metropolitan Opera plans to open on January 1. Really? I don't think that's happening. Hmm. We've heard every one of your programs since we found out about you and also listened to TWIP and TWIM. It's important to us to have access to real science. We've told all our friends about TWIV, encouraged them to listen so they can get real and cutting-edge information. Program 632 with the comprehensive update on the progression of COVID and the newer discoveries using steroids, dexamethasone, in the second week and anticoagulants in the third was so useful that I actually transcribed Daniel Griffin's full update for my mother and for several <laughs> friends. 640 with Dr. Fauci and 641 with Michael Minow are also both chock full of vital information. Minow's suggestion of an inexpensive saliva test with quick results seems like a no-brainer for widespread adoption to allow us all to have any kind of life outside of our homes. 
Mm. You are the most thorough, reliable source of updates and information on the subject. Thank you for the wonderful service you're providing, making your expertise available to the general public as well as medical professionals. And you're a lot of fun. Oh, shucks. <laughs> we wanted to ask for your commentary on two articles we saw in the news. The first was that Rensselaer Polytech claims heparin may neutralize the virus that causes COVID-19. Really? And uh, sends a, a link to an article. Common FDA-approved drug may effectively neutralize the virus that causes COVID-19. The vi heparin could be used as a decoy to prevent uh, the virus from infecting cells. So this is a uh, article from, you know, it's a press release uh, from Rensselaer. And let's see if there's a link to a, a article. There is. It's published in Antiviral Research. Characterization of heparin and severe SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein binding interactions. Yes. So apparently heparin binds the spike uh, and um, really? Really? You know, That's cha it. changes its conformation. That's the whole paper. Heparin binds to spike. That's it. There's no activity here. Yep. There's no infectivity okay, so assays, right? That's uh, that's um, several um, parsecs removed from any sort of <laughs> parsecs. therapy. Very good parsecs. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, so that's that one. The second is an Israeli U.S. team found that phenofibrate pheno could interfere with the ability of the virus to reproduce. So let's take a look at this. This is from an Israeli news source. Israeli U.S. team find drug that can stop COVID in its track. So right there, I'm suspicious. Mm -hmm. This track <laughs> business. Coronavirus causes lungs to accumulate fat, so cholesterol-lowering drug may help downgrade virus threat to that of a common cold. I don't think so. Nope. Let me see if there's Next. a paper here. No paper linked. It's not just about fat accumulation in the lung. Oh, yeah, they mention a paper in Cell Press from um, Ben Tenover and uh, Yaakov Namias, um, but they don't have a link to the paper. All right. Please keep up what you're doing. We love the banter. We love the information. We love being challenged to look up new terminology every time we tune in. Thank you. <laughs> Jenna and Joe, Santa Fe. Nice to see. Oh, that's Dixon. Sorry. It um, is me. That's right. You said Dixon is nice to see. They're staying in tune. <laughs> um, by the way, if anything is published about these two uh, yeah. pieces of information that you point out, we will certainly take a look at it. But right now, nothing worth looking at. All right. Let's do one more round, okay? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. We're back to Rich. Jess writes, hi, Twiv team. Per the most recent episode about... Science writers and journal preprints. I'm curious about the route one follows to become a science writer. Ooh. Oh, oh, Alan, Alan, right. We put this uh, put this aside. <laughs> Let me put this aside for next Do time. That. Yeah, next time because I thought Alan would get this, but he left. He okay, did. go to the next one, Rich. Okay. Um, Saskia writes, "Dear Twiv team, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. The current pandemic made me, like many others, an enthusiastic Twiv listener." In February, I started listening to Christian Drosten's podcast, uh, didn't miss an episode, and wanted to learn uh, much more about viruses. I told A friend told me about Vincent's virology lectures, and I watched all of them. Of course, I also started listening to TWIB. I haven't missed an episode since the beginning of April. I'm also listening to older episodes as well as some twin, immune, twim, etc. After listening to Michael Minna in episode 640, I was as excited as you were by this new way of looking at testing, and I immediately wanted to tell our government experts about it. Since I do not know anyone up there, I wrote with little hope an email to the Swiss National COVID-19 Science Task Force. It gives a link created to advise Swiss federal government in the current pandemic. I sent them links to the Med Archive preprint and, of course, to F640. Uh, see emails in German uh, below. Incredibly, after only 15 minutes, I got the following response in English. Quote, thank you very much for the links. This podcast has just been recommended to the team by one of our experts. So the expert <laughs> team advising a Swiss government are listening to TWIV. I really hope they will follow Michael Minna's and your advice. In Switzerland, we are doing quite okay at the moment, 
but far too many people behave as if SARS-CoV-2 were gone. Yes. Thank you very much for your fantastic work. I'll keep listening, as will, hopefully, our government experts in Switzerland. All the best. Saskia and Saskia is in Zurich. Zurich. Terrific. Uh, Terrific. I, was, I was in Zurich in, Zurich in November 2018. I did a couple of, I did one TWIV there. It was great. Back when you could do that kind of thing. Not happening this year. Nope. Brianne. Uh, I, I think Sorry. this, I think this uh, testing thing has a lot of traction. It does. I think, you know, you bet. we'll see. Okay, Brian, right. go ahead. These are, these are now a little bit older, so let's see what we get. <laughs> All right, so Hansen writes, Hansen is a Canadian PhD student in Switzerland. The weather here is sunny and pleasant with a high of 15 Celsius. Was interested to hear about the idea that there were, there were no false negatives on the last TWIV, but there's a big disconnect between this idea and what is being reported. Um, and he gives a link. And also anecdotes like this one, where the husband almost certainly died of COVID, but tested negative, while the wife tested positive. And he gives another link. Um, and at the end, he says, does TWIV think the false negative rate is really negligible? Or we are we ignoring yet another variable that further fudges the numbers? Um, I think <laughs> that the Michael Minna episode um, has a lot uh, related to this, as he was talking about um, the cutoff of yeah. CT values and how perhaps someone might be called negative um, due to the cutoff and might actually not be negative. So I, I do not think that there were no false negatives. I don't know um, that that is uh, true. And um, I think, I think you, we talked about that a lot in the, the minute episode. Yeah, what did he said basically if, if you're in these fringe areas on either side of the main production – where there's a little bit of RNA, it could be negative, but it doesn't matter anymore. You know, in the old era here, we were worried about it, but now it doesn't matter. That I would say it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, Dixon. Yes, sir. Ed writes, hello again. Love the show. I had another thought on vaccines and fomites and life of the coronavirus or other on various fomites. As the virus breaks down on various surfaces outside of a human cell, is there ever a virus state that is harmless to a human being in terms of invading a cell and replicating, but at the same time causing an immune response based on the deactivated version of the virus in its breakdown state? And Vincent, you wrote... Yeah, it's called inactivated vaccines. There you go. <laughs> but we need to, you need to concentrate them. It's not that you can yeah. just take a little yeah. bit that's yeah. and, and yeah. you yeah. need yeah. to make yeah, a lot. You're not going to pick up enough on a surface to uh, to immunize yourself, but that is the concept behind a, an yeah. inactivated vaccine. Yeah, I mean it's good thinking. Yeah, it's uh, we we purposely break it down, but we give you a lot. I uh, mean, one of the polio uh, vaccines is like that. Yes. Yes. Many vaccines are like that. Many so let's vaccines. see how many we can name. So I would say there, there, are lots, there are lots of influenza vaccines that are inactivated. Let's say virus vaccines. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a, an uh, inactivated polio vaccine. Then, mm, of course, not inactivated, but they're virus-like particle vaccines. They are yeah. not inactivated, H though, Hepi. technically. Uh, uh, Hepi, HPV, uh, human papillomavirus, that's a, a virus-like particle. Anyway. Um, and in fact, someday I want to, talk about this a little more, the human papillomavirus vaccine, because we've talked about the notion that perhaps a vaccine might uh, work by a mechanism immunologically that does not mimic exactly natural immunity, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, might even work better. And I think the human papillomavirus vaccine is right. an example of that. Uh -huh. Yeah, we should get someone who's may have been involved in the development. I've had some correspondence with John Schiller on this, and right. I can I can relate that. All right, our last email for today, David. In terms of the comments about emergency preparedness by hospitals in the UK, we all have major incident plans which are tried and tested to deal with sudden disasters resulting in a single influx of patients, such as major car pileups, stadium disasters, <laughs> etc. We also have plans to allow us to increase surge capacity to deal with winter pressures, although these are sometimes less effective than we would hope. You are quite right that hospitals tend to run right at the limits of capacity much of the time. Over the winter in the UK, hospitals often report occupancy rates over 100%, 
which whilst being scientifically inaccurate <laughs> is more than we use admission areas and discharge areas to hold patients whilst inpatient bed spaces are turned around to allow the new admission. The problem with coronavirus is that all of these patients are coming over a very short time scale, but also many are not able to be discharged quickly. This is one of the major problems. Imagine one of those sliding puzzles we had as children where every <laughs> space had a piece of the puzzle so that you could no longer slide the pieces around. That's what's happening with coronavirus. We have new patients coming in, but we're not able to get patients out to allow for this. And David is a consultant clinical microbiologist from the UK. Right. Um, and this is quite an old email, but it's relevant because remember yep. some time ago we were talking about how the capacity of hospitals. And so here is someone who knows uh, about this. And by the way, I wanted to show everybody the TWIV um, face mask here. I got mine. Oh, right. awesome. Right, there you go. It's, uh, I can Shouldn't put it we over. Shouldn't we have them? We should actually, we are infecting each other, right? Right now over the, the airway. Oh, it's a virtual virus, but come on. <laughs> so this is, um, you know, this is pre presumably washable. And uh, it's that's the virus of TWIV. And, uh, How do we get one? I will give you some. I will give if, I if you guys want patron? one, I'll send them to you. You would you like one, uh, Dixon? I would love one. Brianne, would you like one? Sure. She's not going to say no. Ad. Take Terrific you. ad. You're not going to say no, right? <laughs> no, of course not. Yeah, it's free. I will, I will send it to you. Uh, I will send it to you. My compliments, because since I can't pay you, uh, <laughs> you could pay us. <laughs> we never said don't do that <laughs> make sure you uh move that uh email from jess uh down to the queue yeah yeah yeah, queue. yeah 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 i i hope that uh, alan would do that i forgot that he leaves but we'll put that up next time at the top all right that is twiv six four five hey didn't we just hit 600 we did yeah i know this is crazy we're gonna we hit we're gonna... That, but we started we started coronavirus at 585 yeah, but so, you're doing three a week uh, now, what's right? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, but there are a lot of not. Uh, so that's 60 coronavirus episodes. Um, we're going to hit 700 before the end of the year at this, this rate. This should be labeled as this every other day in virology. <laughs> uh, you know, you said after 500 that you weren't going to celebrate every 100 episode, and we all went, we can celebrate 1,000, ha, 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 and... You know, that's right around the corner. <laughs> we'll work it up to that one. That's right. Well, right. You guys decided to celebrate 600 by giving me that, that lovely Luke Jerem sculpture. Oh, that's which right. Was, yes. Which is gorgeous. You know, we saw that on when you were interviewing Tony. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have it behind me. It's lit. It's on a lighted platform. Yeah, it's very dramatic. It's true. It's wonderful. That's true it it's really cool. Yes. Uh, but uh, that these face masks you can get at uh, Zazzle.com. Uh, we, we only get a buck or two from each one the point is not to make money but you know you guys walk around with this you it's a good uh, ad it's a great ad yeah. and also i noticed so over at cafepress.com slash twiv holy moly you guys are buying up stuff like <laughs> crazy okay shirts <laughs> hoodies mugs so great i'm hoping to run into people one day with the, these shirts <laughs> on because they're going to get up to those numbers at some point so thank you again i we, recommend the hoodie you like the hoodie, yeah. I do. Uh, they're available for all the podcasts, actually, except Twin. I haven't done Twin yet, but uh, thank you for your support. And, of course, uh, people who are supporting us already, thank you so much. We appreciate it greatly. Uh, you can do that over at microbe.tv uh, slash contribute. And, of course, uh, show notes, microbe.tv slash twiv. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and the Living River dot org or com what is it um i think dot org it's a dot yeah, it's org. org it's an orgy it's an org yeah dixon thank you so much good time good time thank you and you had a nice fishing week right i did well i went fishing that's that's for me that's a good week <laughs> all right thank you whether i caught much. anything or not that's beside the point brian barker is at drew university on twitter bio prof barker thank you brian thanks it was great to be here Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. You have a nice background. It looks really good today. I don't know. But uh, listen, my, uh, uh, you got to thank my wife for that. Thank you, Ibby. Okay. Because she saw, she realized that there was a lot of video going on and she started doing it. So you can see we got a, uh, let me see if I can do this. 
cover plant here plant is nice <laughs> okay <laughs> on a table that wasn't there before we got a buddha buddha's cool we got uh, <laughs> this uh rubbing from thailand jones thailand Place. yeah thailand yeah They're nice yeah. Okay. And then there's so, a vi your virology cover, I see. Got my virology cover, yeah, with some family pictures. Family pictures, And then good. the old-time family pictures. And there's my uh, Rebel Alliance insignia <laughs> uh, ball cap. And you put that on whenever you go outside, right? You bet. <laughs> I want people to know that I'm part of the resistance. But also the light <laughs> coming in today is very nice. It's very soft yeah, it coming nice. in the window. It do you, is. Do it you is. have a, a curtain on the window, by the way? Uh, no, it's, uh, it is covered up. Nice. Covered I mean, up. it's, uh, uh, wide open. All right. Yep. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>